All right, we are back from my ad break. Coming up is Eternal Sonata by Oru. So, everyone is ready on our end. Without further ado, Oru, feel free to take it away. Good. All righty, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Oro, the Team Cherry Certified Boyish Heartthrob. I'm joined here by my wonderful girlfriend, Cassie, who we actually met because of this game shortly after I started running it back in 2015. Been together ever since. Why don't you go ahead and say hello? Hello. <laughs> All right, without further ado, we'll go ahead and just get started and we'll get right into explaining things. So uh, whenever time is ready. All right, uh, we'll go three, two, one, go. So we'll go three, two, one, go. All right, so this is Eternal Sonata. This is a game that was released on the Xbox 360 originally um, back in 2007, uh, pretty early back in the 360's life cycle. Um, it's kind of in the same camp as like Blue Dragon uh, and Lost Odyssey as far as kind of early 360 games that were JRPGs that were during that period where the 360 just wasn't doing super well in Japan. Uh, this game did later get a PS3 version that is drastically different from this version. Um, so hopefully that's another thing I get to show off uh, years in the future. Uh, I did run this back in 2016. That was the first Limit Break I was a part of. Um, and I've been a part of this event ever since. Um, I hope you guys enjoy the layouts. I've been working on those uh, for quite a, lot, a while as well. Um, but yeah, so basically the premise of this game is the entire game takes place within the dreams of the famous pianist Chopin on his deathbed. Um, and that sounds as cra uh, ridiculous as a preface as it, it can be, um, but they actually do his life a huge service, um, sprinkled throughout the game. Unfortunately, we're not gonna see any of them tonight, um, but sprinkled throughout the game are um, kind of educational cutscenes that will show photos from places he's been in his life, um, talking about little informational snippets about his life um, and playing his music during those cutscenes. Um, each chapter is themed after uh, one of his pieces. Um, and yeah, they do a, a really great job just honoring his life and not being, um, you know, just nonsensical about it. I mean, they still are, but, um, so we had to say hi to the kitty there. Um, <laughs> my kitty at home is apparently might... having a fun time with Cassie, so. What's up? Yeah, she is. You, <laughs> we might not see any of the um, educational cutscenes, but you do have me as the excellent commentator with Chopin facts, ready to fire at any moment. We sure do. So really quick here, uh, we're going to get a longer fight than we had that I kind of glossed over before. Uh, we'll explain the combat here really quickly. Um, so this game is turn-based and real-time at the same time. So during each character's turn, you're given several seconds to act. Uh, you can move around, attack, do whatever you want um, during those turns. Um, and this game also has a focal light and dark mechanic that we'll kind of touch on as it becomes relevant, where certain enemies will transform into different enemies based on whether they're in the light or the shadow. Um, every character also has a set of light special attacks and dark special attacks. So not only is our positioning going to matter as far as taking out enemies, but it's also going to matter as far as which specials we're able to use. Um, so you see there on the left, there's our timer. Um, currently, we have unlimited time at the start of our turns to kind of think about what we're doing. Um, and in between actions, when we're not inputting anything, it will also freeze the timer. That will change over the course of the run, and we kind of have a mechanic that both makes the game easier and harder at the same time, but we'll touch about on that as we get to it. Um, so early on here, we're going to be grinding to level two before the first boss. This kind of serves twofold. Um, firstly, we're just doing more damage to the boss because early levels scale pretty well. Um, but it also kind of circumvents the boss has a healing mechanic where it can heal itself when it's at low HP. Um, and usually if you go into the fight at level one, the boss can actually out heal the damage that you do over the course of like one turn cycle. Um, so the boss can theoretically heal uh, infinitely. Um, and what being level two allows us to do is out DPS that healing, um, which prevents us from getting into that situation in the first place, which is very, very nice. Um, this actually isn't something we were doing for the longest time. Um, but I one person I really wanted to shout out as far as this game recently is a Japanese runner, runner by the name of Wasude Mono, um, who is the person who got me to come back um, to this game earlier in the year. Um, 
So the person who kind of pioneered this speed run um, is named SC2 Valor. And I actually got into this game because I found uh, their guide for the game, the speed run, on GameFAQs of all things. Um, this was before speedrun.com. This is before Discord. This was before a lot of things. Um, so I found this guide on uh, speedrun.com, or GameFAQs, excuse me. Uh, learned the game from that, and you know I'm still here eight out, or eight years later, um, still running the game. Um, I'd been walled pretty hard on trying to beat uh, SC2 Valor's previous record of 31018. That that stayed for years and years and years and years. Um, but then Wasabi Mono came out of nowhere, hadn't had any runs on the leaderboards previously, came out with a 308, um, and that really got me to come back and kind of take another look at the route really put things under a finer look. And now, just before the event, I set a new record of 305.45, which still has a long way to go. My sum of best is down to a 256, I think now. Um, so there's still a lot of potential in this game. This is just one of those games where a lot can go wrong and it's very hard to get everything to line up all in one go. Um, so anyways, here we have the first boss. This is Bread Gang. Um, this is the boss I alluded to for the reason we went to level two. Um, so this boss has two adds, which are just the enemies in the area. We can thankfully take care of them a little bit easier now that we are uh, level two. Um, previously, we needed Beat to crit these uh, mice at least once. Unfortunately, this one guarded, so it's not going to die, and we'll have to have Allegretto clean it up. Um, so this boss is basically abusing the fact that the timer freezes whenever we're not doing anything. Um, so this is basically the only fight where we're going to be uh, just spamming our special attacks. And we have the boss in this particular spot so that Beat can stand in the shade, and Allegretto will also be able to stand in the shade. Um, Beat has uh, his only damaging special attack right now can be used in the shade. His light special uh, will take photographs, which will come into play a little bit later in the run. Um, so this is a little weird just because I had to finish off that top mouse with Allegretto, but basically what we're aiming to do here is stand in a spot that allows us to double hit Bread Gang with uh, Phantom Wave. Phantom Wave is kind of balanced in such a way where the game thinks you're kind of only gonna be hitting with it once, um, but any enemy with a longer hitbox, we can kind of double hit it like this. Um, one of many changes the PS3 version employs is that a lot of special attacks are uh, rebalanced and largely just buffed. Um, Phantom Wave does a ton more damage on PS3, and this fight is a lot less scary on PS3. Um, but this is a huge reset point for the 360 version, partially because of that healing mechanic that I uh, alluded to earlier. Hopefully we won't see it, um, so we'll kind of see what happens here. And we'll get better into position here. Also, Bread Gang is kind of funnily called that because in the story, Allegretto is... Well, both him and B are orphans, and they're kind of stealing bread for the other orphans. So, he wants to take your bread. A lot of the names of bosses and enemies in this game are really, really funny and just kind of bizarre. This game definitely kind of owns its peculiarity. Yeah, there's a lot of things in the game that are musically named, like the characters, for example, but it's not consistent. Most of the enemies, or all the enemies, are not musically themed, but like locations are and characters are. Yeah, enemies are strangely like the only thing in this game that aren't overly like music themed. There's only so many music terms that they can pull from, I suppose. All right, that was a pretty good fight despite a couple little mistakes. No heal. That's all you can really hope for with this fight. So that was our little introduction to Allegretto and Beat, which is essentially one half of our protagonist pair. Um, the other half we saw briefly, which was Polka, um, but we're gonna be getting to do a little bit more with her and she's gonna meet up with Chopin himself, who is actually a playable character in this game as well. Um, so the big question, I guess, for people that haven't played this game is, you know, since this is in Chopin's dreams on his deathbed, is he aware of the fact that he's in a dream? The easy answer is yes. He's very, very aware of it. Um, and he's kind of just like chill with it. He's kind of just like, all right, I'm here. I'm hanging out with everybody. You got, whatever you guys want to do, I'm here for. Um, and we get to the cutscene at the end of this area. We'll talk about that a little bit. But he um, is basically just talking to Polka about 
the fact that they're in his dream and um you know usually if someone tells you that you are a fragment of their imagination or a figment of their imagination excuse me um that you wouldn't feel too great about that um but polka's just very positive about it she's very chipper and she's just like you know what i might be part of your dream but i want to live my life to the fullest and i'm just going to enjoy every second of it which is just really great to hear um so one thing we're doing in this area is again uh we're farming uh for a couple levels here uh we want to get to level three for this next fight which means we're gonna have to get two level ups and we have to kill seven enemies um certain encounters here are fixed two enemies and some of them are random between one and two um the one i took there is actually a fixed one um so we're going to be getting three guaranteed doubles from here on out to finish off the seven and make sure we're not killing off any excess enemies um again this we're kind of grinding here just because our damage is really really low to start off um and this next boss is actually one of the kind of grindier fights in the entire game um this is the only one we're actually going to be trying to poison um so poison is a debuff you're able to inflict in this game that does uh percentage health damage on each of the enemy's turns um and this boss just has so so much hp that it's really the only feasible way to chip through it quickly um, otherwise, if you don't poison the boss, it takes upwards of like a minute to a minute and a half more to beat it, plus it greatly increases your chance of dying to it. Um, so this is definitely going to be one fight where if we don't get the poison, I'm going to be just loading up a save and trying again. Thankfully, we have two shots at it, and it's 40% each. So we're pretty likely to get it. Um, you know, a lot of times in practice, I'll get it. So we'll just keep our fingers crossed here. Um, so this is something I'm employing that you're going to see me doing a lot throughout the run. Um, various enemies in this game are reactive to where your character is and what you're doing. Um, so if they can see you, they'll kind of follow you and try to chase you around. But you can manipulate that to the point where if an enemy sees you and you kind of move out of their range, like you can tug their vi vision range to the, kind of the edge of the, the road, essentially. And if you move out of their range entirely, it'll sometimes reset their AI and get them to start doing other things. So a lot of enemy passes in this game. I'm going to be trying to do that to get them to kind of look away and then reset and turn away and stay turned away from me. Um, there are certain instances where encounters are just going to have to be brute forced through and we just don't really have a choice about it. But um, for the most part, we're going to be trying to do that to avoid as many encounters as possible. So now both characters are level two. It's going to take one more double encounter right before the boss in order to hit level three. And then we're going to go ahead and after this fight, put on those poison white caps that I picked up uh, on the way here in order to poison the boss. And Frederick got an immediate turn here, which is kind of nice. We can try to finish this off. This doesn't always work. Um, it's kind of dependent on whether we get critical hits or not, and we actually get it, so that's really, really nice. Saves a little bit of time. Anytime we don't have to take sitting through enemies' turns is just great, because they have the same turn timer that we do, so it's just a full turn of you know waiting for them to do what they want to do. All right, so we're going to put on our healing items here, and then the poison white caps, and we're going to go into the second boss of the game, Forest Boar. So right away here, the boss is going to run up to one of our characters. We immediately don't want to see it charge. Anytime it charges, it's usually bad. And as soon as it starts charging, it usually doesn't stop or it just does it with increased frequency. So there's there's one, there's two. So unfortunately, really the only good thing you can do here, instead of chasing enemies around, it's better to just let them come to you. And we'll hope he doesn't charge around again. All right. So the special attacks that we have with Polka and Frederick aren't nearly as strong as the ones we had with Beat and uh, Allegretto. So we're going to be just filling our turns with normal attacks and then ending off with uh, specials. And we got the poison on the first try, so that's just terrific. That's nice. everything you want to see. So now the rest of this fight is basically just going to be repeat of um, hitting it with Frederick and Polka, healing as need be, and praying that he doesn't charge. So, Cassie, if you've got some Chopin facts, this would be a great time to hit Oh, Chopin song. facts. Oh, I'm always ready. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say, so the reason that the characters are going into this forest is, so Frederick is talking to Polka how, you know, this is all a dream. Nothing really matters. Um, so Polka 
takes them into the forest because there's these flowers um, called Heaven's Mirror or Death Lights. And it's, she kind of says, like, it's up to you to decide what you want to name them, but people think they're a bad omen because they only bloom um, at night at 2 a.m. in the morning, which is actually when Chopin passed away. Um, but that's when the flowers bloom, and she's like, you know, up to you if what you want to call them if you think they're a bad omen if, or if they're a good omen, I guess. Which is kind of cool. Um, Polka is also based off of Chopin's real-life younger sister, whose name was Amelia. She also died of a young age, and, and in the game, um, Polka is terminally ill, kind of like Chopin. Um, the game world thinks that people who use magic are terminally ill, and it's not actually true thinking, and the PS3 version explains this better, but yeah. Yeah, and something else that's kind of attached to this disease that Polka has in this uh, dream world is that it allows the people who are terminally ill to use magic. So Polka and Frederick are both able to use magic in this world. Um, and that kind of makes everyone afraid of them because they're like, oh, these people can use magic. They're scary. They're going to, you know, infect us or whatever. Um, and kind of the big crux of the early plot in this game is there's um, the main medicine in this world is called floral powder, uh, which we actually have had in our healing um, for these early bits of the game. Um, but uh, the evil maniacal Count Waltz is uh, producing... Uh, a much less safe alternative called mineral powder that he's also heavily taxing, which is uh, putting a lot of the world into poverty. Um, so a lot of our early characters are going to be attempting to go journey to Count Waltz and basically say, hey, this medicine that you're putting out isn't helping anybody. Can you do something about this? Um, not really understanding why he's doing it um, and kind of just like naively hoping for the best and talking to him. Um, his real motive behind um, using this alternate medicine is um, it actually essentially poisons um, poisons people and turns them into mindless zombie slaves. Um, and he's basically using that to create an army um, in order to basically just take over the world. Which obviously is not great. Yeah, it was a pretty decent boar fight. Uh, it didn't really charge around a bunch after the first couple times, so that's really, really great. And obviously we got that, that poison first try, which is fantastic. Um, so what you just saw flash on the screen there is um, that our party level increased. So that's going to happen a few times at fixed points throughout the game. Um, and that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier, where the game is going to get uh, easier and harder at the same time. Um, each party level sort of gives us uh, new toys to work with. Um, in this case, uh, we get access to another key feature of this game's combat, which is called Echoes. Um, so normal attacks in this game will build echoes and they count in increments of four up to 16 and then increments of eight at 24 and 32. Um, and then those echoes are consumed when you use a special attack. And then the damage of that special attack is boosted based on how many echoes you built to. Um, and basically the easy way of thinking about it is every four echoes you spend is another 30% damage increase roughly uh, with you know 16 to 24 adding 60% and then 24 to 32 adding another 60%. So damage scales really, really high if you build echoes and spend them efficiently. And a lot of the combat is gonna boil down to us efficiently building and spending echoes. Um, so from this point on, you're kind of gonna think of characters as like a main DPS and supports where they're one character is going to be spending a lot of your echoes with the rest of them kind of healing and building echoes for that main DPS character. Um, this next fight is going to showcase that pretty well. Um, so we're coming up on Baby Dragon here, which is uh, the third boss of the game. Um, and this is another Allegretto and Beat fight. Uh, the boss is going to also have some mice joining it. We're going to finish those off first, and then the boss is going to be our next focus. Um, this boss can move around a lot, so a lot of what determines a good or a bad fight here is um, how much the boss moves around. Um, a neat little mechanic, too, with the echoes is that um, the game kind of continues counting um, even when you're not hitting those thresholds. Um, so, for instance, here I'm going to build to four and then six 
And the game is going to continue to count after I use my special attack. So you can basically use that to kind of cheat the system a little bit and um, kind of pre-build echoes for the next uh, special while also using a special and consuming the ones you've built. Um, so we're going to see a lot of that throughout this fight to try to get as many echoes built as possible. Um, an interesting thing to note, too, as far as um, the normal attacks of characters is every single character kind of has like a little attack string that they repeat. Um, so Allegretto's is kind of that three hit slash. Beats is kind of composed of two different two hit um, little combos. And the game kind of lets you buffer those, um, even though your turn timer wears off. A lot of times it'll let you sort of finish the combo you're already on. Um, so we're also going to be using that quite a bit as well. Um, in addition to that, if you're in the middle of a string that the game is sort of buffering, it'll also let you use a special attack at the end of that string no matter what. Um, so we're definitely going to be using that to squeeze as many hits as we can possibly on a single turn. How long did it take you to memorize all the blocks in this game? Um, I don't know how to put like a real number on it. It's kind of just something you get a feel for. Um, so yeah, I haven't really mentioned that. Every single enemy attack, um, you're noticing the little uh, guard indicator come up. So that's kind of like an action command like Paper Mario or some other similar game um, where you have an opportunity to block if you press the button at the right time. Um, this game has some weird mechanics around blocking, but we'll get to that when we get there. The basic gist is that uh, both you and uh, enemies can only block if uh, they're facing the thing attacking it. And there's definitely a lot of quirks in this game kind of surrounding that, uh, both good and bad. Um, something interesting to note here, too, with the kind of incrementing echo counter system that I was talking about, once you get to 32, the game stops counting, so you can't kind of pre-buffer the next string uh, once you're at 32. Um, and the hits that your normal attacks do compared to uh, the damage from your specials is drastically lo like low compared to the specials. So a lot of times we're going to be cutting our turns prematurely if we get to 32 because there's really no other value to be gained from continuing to hit the boss. And it actually wastes a lot of time to just kind of sit there whacking the boss, doing pretty inefficient damage. So yeah, here's a direct example of what I was talking about with the buffering. Um, so we started at 16, built to 24 with eight hits. And then the other six hits that we did were immediately put into the next echo count um, after we used the special, which is why it jumped from four to eight almost instantly. Um, and that's really useful here to get to 24 and 32 as soon as possible. Thankfully, the boss is being relatively cooperative and not moving around a ton. The one main thing this boss can do that's really, really bad, and I'm kind of trying to stand in a certain way so that it doesn't do it, is moving into the shade. Because our special attack with Allegretto uh, that we were using on Bread Gang is really bad against uh, Baby Dragon because it's a very vertically oriented enemy. So we can't really double hit it with Phantom Wave and Sun Slash is just gonna do a lot more damage for us. So now we're kind of getting close to where these two parties we've been seeing will converge. Um, so we're running along this path with uh, Polka and Frederick's group. Uh, we're gonna have sort of a boss and then we're gonna run through this with Allegretto and uh, Beat and then they're gonna meet up and have a fight together for the first time. I love the music in this area. This game has a beautiful soundtrack by Motoi Sakuraba, um, who also composed a lot of the Tales games. Uh, he's done some work for the Souls franchise. There's a lot of things that he's done. He's very, very prolific in the video game industry. And uh, yeah, this chapter is called. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to make a joke about it. it's. It's incredible that he was able to collaborate with Chopin. Well, well after um, he left us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say this chapter is called Raindrops. Um, really beautiful piece by Chopin that plays during that historical cutscene, but you can see it's raining throughout this whole chapter. Yeah, they'll do just enough to 
kind of make those connections to the Chopin songs that they theme every chapter on. Some of them are more fitting than others, but... Also, yes, this is oh, an no, intended death. Um, this is Fugue, <laughs> voiced by the lovely Johnny Young Bosch. Um, he's basically um, an assassin for Waltz, um, and we kind of just run into him, and he doesn't like us, and he's just like, all right, uh, I'm going to act bothered by you and uh, get rid of you. Um, so yeah, now we're following the footsteps of um, Polka and Frederick, and uh, we're going to follow them into Ogogo Village. And Cassie, if you want to talk about a little bit more story significance for Ogogo Village. Yeah, so this is where... Um... I guess we don't get introduced to Salsa quite yet, but this is where she's from. Um, significance of Agogo Village is it's where like the glowing Agogos live is in this forest. Um, and glowing Agogos are kind of something that they don't make super clear in this version of the game. They make them a little bit clearer in the PS3 version. Um, but basically when Polka's around Agogos, they start to glow and People aren't really sure why. It's kind of a, a strange phenomenon. It is revealed later um, why this happens, but Count Waltz ends up actually using these agogos for the mineral powder medicine. So basically using creatures to create this mineral powder. And what do you know? Glowing agogos are even more effective um, and can make you into really huge boss monsters, which we'll, we'll see later. So yeah, now we've got the parties together. Um, Polk is being attacked by this monster known as Ogre Champ. Um, and uh, this is our first fight that we get to use um, these two parties together. Um, so this is gonna be another fight we're gonna be using Allegretto as our main DPS, as it were. Um, and we're gonna be largely building Echoes for him. Um, Beat's gonna be finishing off these two enemies for us. Hopefully they're uh, both finished off in one clean special attack. Unfortunately, Beat can like super, super low roll on damage and not finish them off. Um, but that's good on the first one. And the second one, okay. Sometimes the game does that where it doesn't quite know if the enemy is dead or not yet. And it just kind of takes a second. So it made me nervous there. Those, dam those numbers actually looked really low. So I wasn't sure if that was actually gonna kill, but thankfully it did. Usually it's better if the bottom enemy doesn't die because it's easier to finish it off. Um, but yeah, thankfully I cooperated. And yeah, once again here, building up to 14 so that we can pre-buffer the next string. We're going to be moving Beat away to just kind of save him. We don't really need him for anything else in this fight, so we just want to make sure he doesn't die because we do need him to get experience for later. Um, we're using Frederick here to kind of bait the boss into staying in the light because, again, we don't have a great uh, dark special attack to be using with Allegretto just yet. So we really want him to stay in this sort of central area, and we're going to be attempting to push him up um, kind of through this gap at the top. Um, enemies, especially larger enemies, it's going to be way more important to position them correctly because they will kind of back up at uh, arm's reach to be able to hit you correctly. Um, so we can kind of use that to push uh, a lot of bosses where we want them to go. Um, and yeah, we kind of just have to hope they behave. Thankfully, this one's a little bit more consistent than some other bosses we need to move around a bit later. So yeah, we're going to build up uh, Echoes one more time here, and that should finish the boss off. Um, this boss can also heal itself, but they balanced this heal a lot better than the one on Bread Gang. This boss heals itself for about half of the value that Bread Gang does, which just really puts into perspective how overpowered Bread Gang's heal is. Um, a lot of bosses on the PS3 version were given drastically reduced health. Um, presumably they assumed bosses just had too much health on this version. Uh, but they also give you a lot less experience to compensate for that. So you kind of have this really weird experience curve in the PS3 version that ends up making the game a lot more difficult. And there's a lot more differences with the PS3 version as well, but we'll touch on those as we go. So now that we have our two parties together, we're going to make our voyage to uh, where Count Waltz is and try to talk him out of doing the evil that we don't realize is evil. We just think he's making an honest mistake and we'll soon learn that we are very, very wrong. We are very naive in thinking that asking for lower taxes will work. <laughs> 
If only it was that easy. <laughs> and now we're met with a very ominous roadblock of the three billy goats gruff. <laughs> For some reason, there's just these goats on this bridge that got lost from their herd. And uh, we need to feed them paper in order to get past them because we can't just walk around them, I guess. They're very, very scary goats. They're honestly pretty cute, but... I have a strong feeling that this game wants to heavily imply that Chopin was afraid of goats because some of the scariest enemies in the overworld are actually goats. Um, and this is the first area that they show <laughs> up. Um, various enemies in this game have drastically different kind of um, reactions to the player. Some of them kind of just stare at you. Some of them will like just stare at the wall a lot of the time. And some of them just have ridiculous movement speed. And uh, goats can like see you with their butts. They run insanely fast and uh, they will just run you down if given the opportunity. So we're gonna stay very, very far away from them. Um, and they also are extremely fast in fights. Um, which, as far as getting into extra encounters, is I extremely bad. Um, because if an enemy outspeeds you, um, you will have to sit through all of their turns um, before you get the chance to act. And the way that running away works in this game is you have to hold the uh, left bumper and right bumper for the entire duration of a turn. If the game registers at any point in your turn that you were not holding those buttons, you will fail to flee. But otherwise, it is completely guaranteed. So usually you get in encounters with goats. There's three enemies. They all go before you. They all have like five second turns. And yeah, it, the time loss adds up really, really fast. Um, so we're going to attempt to avoid that. Thankfully, later in the game, since our turn timer is shorter because of the party level system, it's actually less punishing to get into encounters later, even though it actually ends up being a lot easier to avoid encounters in the first place. But um, it is nice that when we get into them later, it's a lot less punishing. So now that the goats have gotten their nice uh, dinner of our homework, um, we're going to proceed through to the next boss, and we're going to get another new character by the name of Viola. So Viola is very, very important for a lot of the fights in this run. Um, so she has a bow, um, and she has two different forms of normal attacks. So she has a normal melee attack string like everyone else, but if she's far enough away from her target, she goes into kind of an over-the-shoulder first-person mode. Um, where she's able to shoot enemies with her bow. I guess they figured that aiming is really, really hard, and it kind of is. Um, but to compensate for that, they gave her a ton of damage on these attacks. And it's actually even more in the PS3 version, which is wild. Um, and uh, we're going to see just how broken that is on this next fight. And we're going to be using her for a lot of the fights. Um, so this goat, we're kind of bringing to the edge of its extremely wide um, aggro radius, resetting it and just barely getting away from it. This encounter was kind of just a nightmare for the longest time, and I believe it was PX who ended up finding uh, that setup for getting past it. Um, and yeah, that saves like 20, 25 seconds just because of how bad getting into an encounter is, which is absolutely crazy. Um, so this next boss, um, there's two enemies called Maledictors, and these are basically enemies that are sort of created from people who are corrupted by this mineral powder. Um, they can do one of two things. They can move t closer to us or they can move farther away from us. We're going to hope they move farther away from us. Uh, Viola does more damage with her bow based on uh, her proximity to the enemy. So we want them to be as far away as possible. Um, so the first one moved back and unfortunately she auto aimed to the other one. So we're just going to get a little bit of damage here uh, just to clean things up a little bit. The other one moved close, which is not great. Um, we're going to hit it with Allegretto a little bit just to kill or to build some echoes in case we have to finish it off in melee. Um, this is also the fight where we're going to be taking pictures with Beat. Uh, so you basically get like no money from fights in this game. And the main way they assumed that you'd be getting money is from selling photographs. However, the amount of money you get from it is really, really high. So we're going to take eight photos here, just in case the game gives us bad ranks on them. And then we're going to be selling uh, four of them. And that's going to be way more money than we'll ever need. Um, photography is apparently an extremely lucrative business in Chopin's dreams. Um, again, if only it was that way in real life. You just take one picture and it's enough to fund your entire life. 
yeah, this fight's getting a little messy, but that's okay. I'm gonna build some more Echoes here. We're gonna end up just using uh, Viola to try to finish it off. Because her damage is really, really high here, even in melee. Um, so Viola has uh, two special attacks at this point. Her light one is called Sacred Strike, which is just a really strong um, single hit. I say really strong. It's kind of all the power is focused into a single hit, but it's not actually very good. Um, her shadow special is Bone Crumble, which does a ton, a ton of damage, as you just saw there. And it's a really nice backup for this fight in case you need to uh, finish it off that way. And as you can see, too, with the experience being as high as it is on the 360 version, bosses are giving us several levels per fight, which is going to keep us on pace with the game for the entire game, basically. We don't have to grind anymore. Um, again, the PS3 version, that's very, very different, and we will wind up very, very underleveled in that version. Um, and I guess I'll go ahead and say right now, too, if you have not played this game, either version, I do strongly recommend playing the PS3 version, even though it does have some kind of performance blips just because it is a PS3 game. It has more content, the story's more fleshed out, uh, there's a lot more voice lines, there's just a lot more content in the game. It's also a lot more challenging from a casual perspective. Um, so yeah, if you ever look to pick up this game, definitely grab it on the PS3. Um, unfortunately, as far as the 360 version is concerned, this game was kind of left in the dust by Microsoft, unfortunately, because not a whole lot of people know about this game in general. Um, and this is one of the few games that is not available on Xbox One, Series S, Series X backwards compatibility, which makes me really sad because the game would load so much faster. Not that the loads in this game are too crazy long anyway, but um, it would speed the run up so, so, so much if you know, we had the backwards compatibility. Um, the 360 does have a feature where you're able to install games to your hard drive. And in a lot of cases that did speed up loading and kind of clean some things up. However, this game will always crash in the same place near the end of the game if you have the game installed. So basically any positive that you could get out of it is just immediately um, removed as soon as that crash happens. Um, and there's just really no way around it that I've found, unfortunately. So we're gonna be running through uh, another dungeon here called Fort Fermata um, before our next boss. Uh, this dungeon's main gimmick is that there are switches on either side of the dungeon. There's kind of two halves of a big circle. And uh, pressing those switches will change the orientation to the platforms and things in here. Um, it's very, very confusing casually. I would get lost in here for hours when I played this game originally. Um, thankfully, as far as the speedrun is concerned, we press one switch and then it's kind of straightforward after that. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, we'll run in through here. Cassie, if you've got any more fun facts for us. Yeah, so um, Chopin, for those who don't know, was actually born in Poland. Um, but he spent most of his life in Paris because Poland had some wars going on. Um, but mo both of his parents were musicians, so that's kind of what led him to playing the piano. Um, but yeah, he would play at a handful of private parties in Paris, and he was a piano teacher for a while, but um, he never did too many big public performances, but he only lived until he was 39. He died at a kind of a young age from what people believe was a heart or a lung problem. Chopin facts. <laughs> also, shout outs to this little lizard on the wall. I very much appreciate whatever person worked on this game and really thought this room needed just a cute little lizard running on the wall. It's just, there's so many weird little details in this game that's it's just really fun to point out. And really, this game is just gorgeous. The soundtrack is amazing. The visuals are amazing. It's it's kind of incredible how much work was put into this game when you kind of think about... like It's, it's really interesting to me to think about the story of how this game probably came to be um, because there are a lot of kind of overlap with um, Tales of Asperia as far as um, music, kind of visual design, the time period when they came out. And I don't know exactly, you know, how the games are tied together, if they even are. Um, they're under the same publisher. There's just so many links that tie them together. And a lot of people that look at this game the first time, they're like, oh, this looks like a Tales game. Um, so yeah, it's just something I'd love to know. Um, and I've, you know, tried digging around and haven't really found anything. There isn't a ton of information about this game, as you might imagine. 
Um, but yeah, I kind of picked up this game on a whim. Um, I was just at GameStop with my dad around when it came out and uh, just saw it on the shelf. I was like, ooh, anime. Um, and yeah, grabbed it and I've loved it ever since. And yeah, like I said, I ended up meeting Cassie through this, which just adds even more, even more value to it to me. Yeah, it was really funny. Like back in the day, I was I was just finding out Twitch was a thing and speedrunning was a thing, and I was like, "Oh, Eternal Sonata is like by far my favorite game," but I doubt anyone knows about it, and I surely doubt anyone speedruns it. And by the irony of all things, I happened to search it on Twitch one day and Aura was streaming it, so. And the rest was history. <laughs> and the rest was history. So if you've ever wondered if uh, speedrunning could uh, get you a significant other. There you go. It's right there. The proof is in the pun. There you go. But yeah, I really wonder, like, who who came up with the idea of hmm i want to make a jrpg i really like chopin's piano music what if when <laughs> he was dying he had a dream that just kept looping and i don't know it's just like it's such an insane story yeah that's another thing that isn't super touched on in the 360 version but the ps3 version goes a little bit more into it you find out by the end of the game that this kind of um, dream that Chopin is stuck in has been looping. Um, and the same thing has been happening over and over and over again. And he keeps trying to shatter the dream and it just keeps coming back to the start and he's kind of not aware that it's been looping. Um, and like the whole ending of the game focuses on breaking that loop. And, you know, Motoi Sakuraba composed for the Soul series and this game kind of follows that same, oh, there's a loop. Um, and yeah, this game predates even Demon Souls, so. Yeah, at the end, Chopin is kind of like, this doesn't matter, screw it, I'm going to do what I want at the end, no matter what happens, because this is a dream, nothing matters. And then he kind of wakes up and he's like, wait a second, I didn't wake up in real life. This is a problem. All right, so this next boss is Killer Knight. Um, this is a fight that was kind of a mess um, until right before the event. I actually kind of worked on a slightly better strat for this. So hopefully I won't jinx myself and it'll it'll cooperate here. So this boss again has two extra adds, two more Maledictors. Um, thankfully they aren't as strong as the ones we just fought, um, but we're gonna be finishing them off with Viola and Allegretto and kind of using Beat to try to move the boss into the upper right of the arena and gesturing Viola towards the bottom left so that we can finish off the boss as fast as possible. Um, Viola's arrows also have another mechanic uh, where they can headshot if you're in the right spot of the enemy. Um, so we're gonna be attempting to take advantage of that as well uh, here. Unfortunately, this boss has an attack that it uses with its tail, or weird, I guess it has two tails, but the top tail, the long one, um, it'll turn around and kind of hit your characters with it. And uh, that means we can't headshot it because it isn't facing us. So we're also gonna be trying to keep it in a position where it isn't directly facing Viola, so it won't block, um, but also a position where we're able to hit it if it's facing us. Okay, so we've got that enemy finished off. We're gonna get Viola into position. We're gonna try to get the boss to cooperate here. Again, kind of using the fact that enemies will stand at arm's reach uh, to be able to hit you. We've got it in a decent spot already. And if all things go well, okay. I didn't even get to finish saying it. Yeah, unfortunately too, when bosses block, you kind of just have to brute force and hope that they let up. Um, unfortunately he did not there. So that was kind of a big turn full of wasted damage. Um, so he's not facing us. He can't block, but that also means we're not headshotting. So we are also losing a lot of damage here. Um, ideally, you're hitting for about 35 to 100 to 4,000 on each arrow, but we're only hitting for 2,500. Um, but this fight is kind of just, you got to take what you get, and um, you get through the fight as fast as you end up getting through the fight. I was going to say, when the numbers are in red, does that mean you're critting? Yes, that is a critical hit. Um, my theory is that it's based on your speed. Um, 
a lot of other JRPGs, it's based on your speed, and um, you kind of end up critting more and more as the game goes on. Um, so that's kind of just, there's a lot of kind of back-end mechanics in this game that I'm still not super sure about. Again, there's not a whole lot of information on this game. Um, and a lot of this stuff is hard to kind of science for sure without peeking in the game's code, uh, which we're kind of just not able to do, unfortunately. This boss also hasn't done it yet, but it can showcase um, kind of a weird quirk with the blocking system where sometimes the game will just not correctly register that you're facing it, uh, the enemy, and it uh, just won't let you block at all. Uh, and there's also some instances where if you miss a single block, it kind of locks you out of blocking for the rest of whatever the enemy's doing. Um, and yeah, that was a relatively clean fight. Uh, for the most part, I can't complain. Nice. Um, kind of the reason I changed that fight is we used to move Viola into the bottom right and then push the boss top left. Um, but there's kind of those pillars in the way that the boss kind of tries to like back up around while you're moving it. And it just gets really messy and doesn't really work very well. And sometimes it just gets stuck. Um, and it ended up working a lot better to kind of push it top right instead. All right, so now we are going through another uh, little stretch of path before we get to um, where we're going to meet with Waltz or attempt to meet with Waltz. Um, this is one of the scarier uh, paths in the game um, because it's filled with uh, goats. As I mentioned, goats are extremely aggressive. Um, can see you with basically any part of their body, it seems like. Um, and we're going to be doing our best to avoid them. We basically have to stay perfectly behind them for them to not see us. Um, and yeah. This would be another good time for some Chopin facts, if you've got some. All right, here's a hot one right off the skillet for you. So I mentioned <laughs> that uh, Chopin died at age 39. Um, he did die in Paris. And when he died, his body was buried in Paris. But his sister brought his heart to Warsaw, Poland, which is where they were originally from. Maybe a little morbid fact, but uh, a fact nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one little forced fight um, here. Oh, sorry, go ahead. This is this is just a little cart fight. Um, this guy is under attack, and we've got to save his cart from the monsters and his nice little horse. Uh, yeah, proceed with your fun fact. <laughs> yeah, save the horse. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I found out recently about this game kind of interestingly. Um, the game's text was actually proofread by uh, the Frederick Chopin Society um, that's in Warsaw. So the developers actually went through, you know, some rigmarole to make sure that their factual facts about Chopin um, were pretty accurate. Yeah, like I said, this game surprisingly did a lot of service to his legacy and basically, you know, just took their crazy idea and ran with it and did a great job and they i don't know they, they really gave him a lot of respect and he definitely deserves it his music is fantastic we do still get to hear a little bit of it sort of at the end um but we'll get there when we get there even though we're not hearing all his uh pieces in those educational cutscenes. Oh, do you have time for a couple donations? Yeah, go go crazy. Er, sorry, feel free. Um, got a hundred dollars from Echo Parallax. Thank you very much for that generous donation. We have ten dollars from Bradley Saber, who says shout outs to everyone working the graveyard shift. It's the third shift. It's always such a treat to be able to watch the live event. Thanks to all, and keep up the great work. Yeah, thank you guys for all your very generous donations. This event, like I said, means a ton to me. Um, been involved with it for a very long time now. Um, and actually just something to note too about my own history and kind of uh, my involvement with mental illness. Um, like I said, my I ended up finding this game because of my dad. Um, and 11 years ago now, I actually lost him because he took his own life. Um, and because of that, uh, mental illness just has a huge, huge importance to me. Um, and just, I want everyone to remember that if you ever feel like you need help, you need someone, do not hesitate to ask. It's very important that everyone just is very in tune with how they're feeling about themselves and 
always ask for help when they need it. All right, so we've traversed the road of goats, um, and we're here to um, convince Walt to stop his evil drug-making ways. Um, but first, we get slightly uh, sidetracked because Timmy fell down the well, apparently. His name's Phil, but um, we find out that this kid has um, fallen off this cliff, essentially, and uh, or uh, gotten lost, and we need to go rescue him. Um, but first, we need to deal with this guy who is harassing the local shopkeep. Um, and this is the guy we're going to sell our photos to, make all the money we need for the entire rest of the game, and uh, pick up some healing items that are going to carry us for a little while. Uh, we're also going to be grabbing uh, one of each of two items called Glowing Tails and Shadow Tails. Uh, what those do is apply a buff to the character they're used on that gives them the Shining Body or Darkness Body um, status effect which puts a aura around them of light or shadow, um, which allows them to um, guarantee using either their light or shadow um, special attack. Uh, we're also picking up some hell mustards, which are an item that uh, drastically increases your uh, offensive power, but cuts your defense in half. Um, kind of your typical high risk, high reward item in an RPG. And we're gonna make great use of it. Uh, we're eventually gonna get an accessory that automatically applies it to whatever character it's on. But until we get that, we have to manually apply it, and Hell Mustards are going to be our way of doing so. So there's Phil's shoe. We're on our way to rescue him. And uh, while we're going through this area, this is another decently long stretch for some more facts. Hmm. We're going through them faster than I was predicting. <laughs> we'll have more to talk about soon. Let's... Yeah, I was going to say um, the game. So the Japanese version of the game is not called Eternal Sonata. It is called Trusty Bell in Japan. I don't really know why they renamed it officially, but Eternal Sonata d does make a lot of sense. Yeah, as we as we touched on. Yeah, it's a looping dream. So Eternal makes sense. And Sonata is just more musical terminology to work with. This is also one of the few areas where the musical term that it's named after actually kind of makes sense. This is called Glissando Cliffs um, and just kind of matches up with uh, a Glissando in music. Um, there's another area later, which is really funny because it's called Dakota Ruins, um, meaning to the end, essentially. Um, so there's, there's a couple areas that are rather um, aptly named, um, but a lot of them are kind of just staple music term to area and uh that's about it um so one little thing to mention here and this is a little bit of tech as far as um interacting with um ladders and ledges so every ledge when you interact with it will kind of move you and jump off at a certain point um and the character kind of like shifts very slowly towards that point that it jumps off if you interact with it at the wrong point so I'm going to be trying my best to interact with the point that I'm jumping off of directly in order to kind of avoid that little animation. Saves a tiny bit of time here and there, but it adds up. Um, this enemy and one of the next enemies I'm going to pass are on a cycle as soon as you enter the screen. Um, so they don't react to the player, but they will kind of do their loop of movement um, over time. And unfortunately, the first cycle doesn't matter because you still have to wait on this cycle. Um, you can kind of brute force yourself and get into an encounter with this enemy and run past it, but it ends up just being faster to wait for it. Uh, there is one enemy later that we're going to have to push our way past. Um, but other than that, every other encounter here is uh, optional. The game does kind of bait you there into jumping off of that ledge instead of taking the rope down, and it ends up getting you stuck on that enemy I just passed. Um, generally, jumping off of ledges is faster than climbing down ropes. As you can see, the animation for climbing down ropes is rather slow, so if we can avoid it, we definitely do. I did notice in this area when we were practicing, the image in the background is not great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd never really like, looked back there they... until you pointed it out. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how they, you know, set this up in game where it's just a big area that's vertical and just one huge photo in the background that 
It should probably be higher quality. They assume everyone's like me and playing this game for seven years without looking back there, so. Yeah. Also, this is a really huge cliff to lose your shoe down. Yeah, this area is very, wow. very long. This is one of the longer <laughs> sort of dungeons in the game. Unfortunately, this is not one of the enemies we're supposed to get into an encounter with and kind of just got in the way. Um, but yeah, as long as we're, again, holding our run buttons the entire time. The run mechanics in this game are very, very bizarre. I don't even remember if they really tutorialize it in the game if they like tell you how to run away. I remember kind of really fiddling with it when I was um, younger and trying to figure out how to run away from fights. And then it like never worked because I wasn't ever holding the buttons the entire turn. Uh, it's just very bizarre how it ends up working out. And yeah, not putting a ton of effort into guarding here because all the damage we take here is healed off as soon as we rescue Phil. Generally, a lot of the damage you do take in areas will persist, and we will be trying to avoid it as much as possible. But yeah, here is one of the main instances where it doesn't really matter too much. So we're finally coming at the end here, uh, getting to the bottom. We're going to send Phil home safe and sound. We're never going to see him because he's just in cutscenes, but I assure you he's fine. <laughs> I can't remember if he, like, fell down the cliff or, like, just was exploring and went too far. Yeah, it's one of the two. So, giving Viola the new weapon we just bought, equipping some healing items and some hell mustards, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and this menu is actually going to cover us for the next three bosses. Um, we hopefully do not need a ton of healing for the next couple fights. Um... And yeah, we're generally going to be taking care of the next couple bosses really, really quickly. Actually, I did remember I'm going to throw one more thing on because I did actually have a character die in one of these fights, which I've never had happen before. Uh, so we're going to be we're going to be careful here and give ourselves one revive to work with. But hopefully, we won't need it. So these next two fights are going to be basically the same. We have to fight the same boss twice in pretty quick succession. Um, this is basically Waltz's um, bouncer, essentially. And uh, he's going to be like, oh, this uh, group called Andantino is expected to be showing up today, and they're up to no good, and blah, 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 blah. And um, he thinks that's us. So he's going to try to kick us to the curb here. Uh, yeah, this is going to be another fight of um, kind of dragging the boss away from Viola and using her to just shoot him with arrows and finish him off that way. Again, trying to headshot him as much as possible. Kind of the first or the top, like, fifth of his body still counts as his head. So as long as we're generally aiming at the right spot, we're going to be fine. Um, the aiming in this game is also weird. So that's another, like, pretty big change between this version and the PS3 version. Um... The vertical aiming on Viola's arrows is inverted on the 360 version, and it's not on PS3. So that's a really weird thing to get used to when switching between versions. And it's also really hard to adjust your aim if you miss. Because the cursor kind of, like, sticks in place. Yeah, we're going to throw it. And I'm Viola. assuming there's no settings to, like, invert or not invert your no, aiming. Unfortunately. Okay. One turn of misses, but that ended up being nice. pretty perfectly okay. So yeah, you can just see the difference in damage there just based on a little bit of movement. That first turn that we're hitting him, we were doing a little bit over 5k per arrow. And then as soon as he moves just a little bit farther away, it gets all the way up to 10k. Uh, the jump is just dr drastic. It's super, super drastic. So we want to make the most use of that distance as we can. Um, so yeah, Tuba just threw us in jail. Um, because he thought we were on Dantino. And, uh, yeah, we meet up with Salsa here, who is, uh, we talked about a little bit earlier. She's one of the twins from a go-go village. Um, and she's going to join us for the next little bit here as we use on Dantino's secret tunnel out of the, um, prison to try to get away. 
We're going to go ahead and swap Salsa into the party here because she is the fastest character we have access to now. And that will allow us to get away from any encounters we get into a lot easier. Um, so there's two main enemies in this area. There's these bats and there's big scorpions. Um, the bats are a lot easier to pass because most of their wings do not have an active hitbox. So we can kind of use that to our advantage to just sneak right by them. This one's still kind of in the way. All right. And then the scorpions also do not have hitboxes on their tails or a good portion of their tails. Um, so we're going to be trying to use that to our advantage to get by. Unfortunately, there's a lot of instances where the fixed camera kind of works to your detriment. And you kind of just have to go for it and hope it works out. Um, unfortunately, this is an enemy that I cannot bait, and I need to just wait for it to move. This is another area where enemies can just bleed a ton of time without you really having much say in it. Um, and this is kind of what I was talking about with r runs being really hard to piece together, uh, like a really good run, because there's just so many things that are out of your control. And a lot of the time you lose in this run is just enemies in the overworld. And um, one of the biggest um, kind of signs of improvement at this run is just dealing with enemy encounters as efficiently as possible, which isn't always the easiest thing to do, because that kind of just comes with experience and seeing different things. And this is a weird spot for this enemy. Oh man, come on, guy. Do me a solid, thank you. Certain enemies like that one too just will not react to you at all. And again, that comes with experience of just knowing which enemies will react to and which ones won't. And every enemy in the overworld, even if it's like the same kind of enemy reacts in very, very different ways. And it's just very, very bizarre. Okay, we got past that one. I actually wasn't sure if that one was gonna work. So there's an enemy coming up here that's always really, really terrifying for me. Um, if the enemy is in a very particular spot, if you try to brute force past it, um, it can turn while you're trying to get past it and it can get you stuck in a rock and make you have to kill the encounter which thankfully he got stuck in the rock himself and we're fine. We can just run right past. But yeah, you can get wedged between the rock and him and just like have no option but to fight it. Um, generally, most enemies, even if they kind of trap you, you aren't going to get in a situation where you have to fight them. You can usually kind of back out and let the enemy do more things and try again. Um, but that is one of the scarier instances of, you know, where an enemy can be. Coming up on the end of Man, Arlampina's I'm you get... passage here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going <laughs> to say, it seems like you get, like, a few iframes when you do run away. Like, your character, like, blinks a little bit. So you've got the chance of you hit them, you run away, and then you've got your iframes to try to get past it. Yeah, your hitbox sort of shrinks as well. So there's a lot of times where, like, you know, you'd think you wouldn't be able to get, po get by, but, like, the iframes kind of shrinking you allows you to squeeze past them. Uh, which is really, really nice. There's a lot of encounters in this game that look required, and they aren't. Um, there's actually an encounter that I thought was required for the longest time. I'll point it out when we get there, but I thought it was required for years. Um, and in Wasude Mono's uh, 308 run, actually, they skipped it. And I was like, oh, I've just been doing that fight for years, and you can just run right past it. It's not a super long fight, but, you know, free time save is free time save. This game definitely had a several year period where it kind of just needed a new set of eyes on it. And again, I want to shout out Wasude Mono a huge amount um, because they really just got me to look at this game in a whole new light and think about things a lot more than I was previously. Um, I was pretty plateaued trying to beat SC2 Valor's previous record of 31018. Um, and it was just really, really hard to you know get past a certain point um, but yeah, that 308 really just changed everything for me, I think. And even just in coming back and prep for this marathon the last couple weeks, I've found a lot more small things to improve the route even more. Um, so yeah, this game doesn't give you a ton of tools to work with, but it's, it's really incredible what you can do just to micro-optimize what little tools you have. Um, so here we're seeing Andantino for the first time. This is Claves in the pink hair, um, Falsetto in the blue, and Jazz in the uh, brown. Um, they're kind of another, um, secret force that's working to oppose Waltz in his, uh, mineral powder. Uh, 
And I guess I'll touch on now too, this game actually does have a pretty prolific voice cast. Um, Jazz is voiced by DC Douglas. Um, Fugue was voiced by Johnny Young Bosch. Uh, Beat is Mona Marshall. Uh, and she actually sounds a lot like Terriermon in this game, which I just love. Beat has uh, his light special, it's called Fire Blast, that we get later. And um, it just sounds like she's saying Bunny Blast, and I love it. <laughs> and there's, there's plenty of other bigger name voice actors in this game, but that was just, you know, to name a few. Um, it kind of just adds to the mystery of how this game came about even more because they just have, you know, all these super big name voice actors involved and it's really, really cool. So yeah, now we've got another At fight the beginning with of the game, And this is basically the same as the first, but yeah, go ahead, Cassie. I was going to say, at the beginning of the game, there's this, like, narrator who, like, is saying this, like, really poetic, like, nature... I don't even know how to describe it, like, narration at the beginning of the game that, like, is kind of confusing when you first start listening to it. I don't know the voice actor who does it, but I know he's... he's in a lot as well. Yeah, we're kind of adjusting Tuba a second time here during this fight, just because of where he winds up the first time. This is just to give me a little bit better uh, aim on him. Because it is kind of hard to hit him uh, if you're aiming right where I first put him, because he's just kind of a, a straight vertical line. So here he's a little bit wider, and we can aim a little bit more easily. And unfortunately, there's an instance of the game sometimes lags quite a bit when you zoom in, which can definitely mess with the muscle memory of aiming. Um, one other slight annoying thing in this game is um, when we're setting up particular turns is that when you skip a character's turn by clicking the left stick, uh, which is another mechanic the game doesn't really teach you, um, it also drastically reduces the delay between that character getting their next turn. So there's a lot of times where we're kind of like double skipping characters' turns just to get to the one that we want. Uh, obviously, it's still faster than um, you know doing something on the character's turn and giving their turn a normal delay. So now that we've beaten Tuba again, um, he kind of kicks us off that bridge that we were on and splits up the party. Um, so unfortunately here, we're kind of split into the good party and the bad party. Uh, we get one party that's got all the good characters in it and one party that's got all the not so good characters in it. Um, so we're gonna be doing a little bit of section here with the um, supposed good party. And then we're gonna do a couple bosses with the not so good party. Um, this area is probably another one of the scariest in the entire run, which is in complete contrast to uh, the music here, which is extremely relaxing. Um, and I actually have a good friend of mine who continually, to this day, I think, still um, occasionally will go to sleep to this song because he loves it so much. Um, and yeah, th this piece is great. Um, but yeah, it kind of just uh, doesn't really fit with how stressful this area is during runs. Again, we've got more of these scorpions, and they're in a lot tighter spots than when we were dealing with the cave. These fish also have really weird long hitboxes, and thankfully they're being pretty nice right now. This one we're going to have to brute, fa brute uh, force past, but it'll work out. Um, so this area also had... Okay, never mind. I jinxed myself by saying it would work out. Um, this area also has another fight that we thought were, was required for the first or for the longest time. Um, but there actually is a very precise setup for getting past it. So now that we're on this screen, we're on a timer. Um, there's another enemy that is on a cycle once we start uh, moving on this screen. And we have a little bit of leeway in getting there, but uh, if we don't make the cycle, we have to wait a long time for the enemy to get into the spot that lets us skip it. Um, fortunately, it's still faster to wait for it than just fighting the enemy like we used to. Um, but it doesn't feel great to kind of get the, uh, the walk of shame, as it were. We're going to try to get this enemy to reset because it is not in a great spot. And unfortunately, this probably wasted too much time. We're going to try to just force this. Show me what you've got. I think we still have just enough time to make it if we get past here. Okay. No, we didn't make it. Okay. So we're going to have to wait for this guy to go all the way up this log and then all the way back down. And then we're looking for a visual cue of its tail 
um, just barely passing the point where it's parallel to the screen. So we're just going to have a nice little walk with our good friend here. Just enjoy the music. Yeah. push our way past again kind of making use of our iframes and the shrunken hitbox to get past there so we're almost out of adagio swamp I'll try to get this fish out of the way i'm not going to let you get in our way it's also funny how on point a lot of the voice lines are in this game oh, okay that didn't work that's fine though looks like it's starting to move okay that was a weird one, because it was kind of perfectly walling us off on both sides. I kind of was like, okay, one side didn't work, maybe the other side will. But you don't get a ton of iframe time, so you kind of have to think quick on what plays you want to go for. And this might get kind of weird if he's turning around. Okay, we're good. Thankfully, this part of the path is pretty wide. So this next area is um, called Woodblock Groves, and its main gimmick is that the air is like a poisonous miasma. Um, we're going to go through the first screen poisoned. Um, thankfully, we don't get any encounters that really matter on that screen. Um, but then Jazz is going to go, hey, this poison is kind of awful. Here's these little pendants that I have that will help us not get poisoned. And then it breaks right away as soon as we get to the boss. <laughs> so I don't know what Jazz is doing. I don't know what discount he got these little amulets from, but uh, they don't work so great. Um, thankfully, poison is not too much of a detriment to us. Poison has kind of a weird side effect that we saw a little bit on Forest Boar a long time ago now, um, but it sort of does the damage as your turn timer is starting, which slightly interrupts your turn timer and slightly reduces the amount of time you have to act. Thankfully, that doesn't really hurt us too much, but it's just kind of a weird quirk to um, poison as a status effect. These mushroom guys are really terrifying. Yeah, they They're definitely made them pretty scary. So those little bouncing onions that we saw at the start of the game, um, when they go into the shade, that's what they turn into. <laughs> so they just like <laughs> grow in size drastically all of a sudden as soon as they touch the shade. Um, Optimally, in a speedrun, you never see any enemy actually transform from going between light and darkness. So unfortunately, that's something we don't really get to show off. Um, but it is kind of weird which enemies turn into what. Like in the uh, secret passage we went through, the bats will turn into the scorpions. And it's just very, very weird to see, you know, the, diff the quite different enemies that they'll turn into. So here we get our neutralizing stone from Jazz. It's not going to help us very much. But that's okay. This area is also really confusing um, casually. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, um, just a bit ago, we passed that one guy, or we passed a boat where you can pick up a score piece, if you want to talk about that. Oh, yeah. So there's a mechanic in this game that's basically a fetch quest mechanic where there's score pieces hidden throughout the game. Um, and there's certain NPCs you can bring those score pieces to. And if you match... Um, so each score piece has a line of music and all the NPCs you bring them to have a line of music. And if you match up the lines of music in a way that sounds good, essentially, you'll get a rank, and if you get a high enough rank, you'll get an item from each of them. Um, there's an item we used to get from one, from the score piece from that boat, um, called the Dark Brooch, which gives us the dark body status effect I touched on earlier that gives you um, the dark aura around your character to allow them to use their special, or their special shadow attacks anywhere. Um, however, we ended up changing the strats uh, to not need that anymore because it was it was really, really slow to get. It took like a minute to go out of your way for the NPC and to play the score. And um, it's also weird. The score that you play doesn't particularly sound good. So it kind of goes against the, the essence of what you're supposed to be doing with them. But yeah, not in the run anymore. Saves a lot of time to not have to do that anymore, which is really, really nice. Um, and there's a big side quest chain uh, that goes into getting all the achievements for this game. Uh, you basically have to play through the game once and then play the new game plus mode called Encore mode. 
Um, the only things that carry over in the New Game Plus mode are um, your party levels and your score pieces. Um, oh, I was on the wrong item. That's okay. That's fine. This enemy might not die now. Um, the way this usually works is you Hell Mustard um, Falsetto and Jazz and kind of use them both for DPS. Um, but I forgot I put that extra Angel Trumpet in for safety, so my uh, items got a little messed up there, but that's okay. As long as we got one on fals uh, Falsetto, that's uh, the main damage we're going to be doing. Um, so the amount of turns characters get is kind of based on their speed. Um, so Jazz is pretty slow, so we're not going to be getting a ton of turns with him. Um, but any extra damage helps. Uh, this boss we also used to use Viola for uh, a little bit, but this boss jumps up and down a lot, and its hitbox shifts accordingly, and it makes aiming with Viola really, really difficult. Um, so it kind of just ended up working out better to uh, not do that. Um, this boss also is the first example of a boss that can revive its adds. Um, so you see their bodies still laying on the ground. The boss can just randomly decide to bring them back up, which actually can work to our benefit. Um, it's generally worth it to finish off adds as soon as you can so that you don't have to sit through long extra turns uh, of them doing stuff. Um, but these enemies, like for instance in this situation, if the boss revives the mushroom that's right below him, um, we could use that to generate extra echoes because if you hit multiple enemies with the same uh, attacks, you build echoes as if you were hitting each of them independently. Um, so you can actually build to really high echo chains here um, if that happens. I actually had a run before I left where it revived it twice, and it died really, really fast because of that. Um, but obviously that happens pretty rarely. It doesn't revive them very much, so kind of just take it when we can get it. And one more chain here with Falsetto should do it. The boss would have been dead if I had correctly buffed Jazz, but yeah, we got it done right there, so. Nice. So near the end of this section with this party, uh, we're kind of getting to another little um, filler bit of the story, Cassie, if you want to explain kind of what's happening here. Um, yeah, I can try. So we're <laughs> arriving at Andantino, which is basically this group's like hideout, literally in a cave. Um, and there's like a village here. So, but they're all kind of part of this like Andantino group that is against um, what Counts, Count Waltz is doing. Um, and as it turns out, we have a spy in our group and it's Claves. So there's a cutscene coming up, I, I think it's soon, um, where Claves is kind of found out and I can't remember exactly how it happens, but she gets, she gets found out and uh, has a really long dying cutscene, like the longest. Ever. <laughs> it's one of the it's more infamous funny. parts of this game. Um, there's a few YouTube videos that talk about this game, and um, it's a very commonly ridiculed part of this game. It's just this comically long sequence of uh, Clave just Clave's just kind of laying on the floor um, and just kind of moaning and groaning for a long time. Yeah, Clave's, um, she is a spy for Count Waltz, but she likes slash loves jazz. So there's kind of this like love triangle going on because falsetto also kind of likes jazz and they've been childhood friends and have known everyone known each other forever then claves comes around along and puts a, a wrench into that relationship so it, it's a whole thing and viola after she meets jazz also starts liking him and jazz is just a really popular guy which i mean it's he's voiced by dc douglas like how can oh, you go yeah. wrong? So this section is one of the sections that if this game was to find any major sequence break, this is probably it. Unfortunately, we haven't found anything just yet. So if anyone at home wants to play around with this section and try to find a skip here, we would love you forever. Um, so basically the whole gist of this dungeon is that there's these red, blue, and green flames that we have to put into these candlesticks. 
Um, and that'll open up the corresponding fog gate uh, that's tied to them. Um, we go through four different sections of the cemetery. We're going to go through in counterclockwise order. Um, and the final section is going to take us right in front of the boss door to get the green flame that lets us get through here. And the whole reason we need the green flame is to get one of the blue flames to the boss door. And it just feels really, really weird to kind of do this roundabout around these doors that were just right there. And unfortunately, the game just gives you no real tools to try to shove past these gates. But if there was a way, you would save a ton, a ton of time just going straight to the boss here. See, so yeah, we're kind of just being more or less taught about that flame mechanic. And this is just a really long section of text basically saying nothing. Yeah, and I think the reason we're in this graveyard in Andantino, which, by the way, there are trees here, and we're, I believe, still in a cave. <laughs> so, but we're in a dream, so whatever happens, happens. That's okay. Um, but there's a, a fountain at, like, the end of this graveyard that there's a little girl who's sick um, in the town, and they think that the water from the fountain will cure her. I believe. Yeah, there's a lot of story beats that I've kind of forgotten about, largely because one, they're not super crazy important, and two, because I don't watch the cutscenes in this game a, a whole ton, if I'm being honest with you. I definitely do owe myself um, another look at the PS3 version because it's just been so long since I've played it. And I've been wanting to work on the speedrun for the PS3 version for years now and i keep finding reasons to not put the 360 version down so hopefully after this event i can get a really nice time that i'm happy with and put it down for a while um sc2 valor who i mentioned earlier who put out the guide for the 360 version on game packs originally um finally did upload a pretty solid ps3 run to sda uh earlier in the year it was quite a, a few months ago now but um, so if you're interested in just seeing what that run looks like, um, it is up on SDA. Um, and it is pretty interesting just to see the differences between this run and that run. And I'm sure the PS3 version still has a long way to go as far as optimizing it. Um, this version is a lot faster still than the PS3 version for the sheer reason that the PS3 version just has a ton of extra content. Um, there's a whole extra dungeon in the middle of the story. There's a whole section with Pol uh, Polka by herself. Um, yeah, there's just a ton of extra stuff. And there's the, uh, it's on the speedrun, obviously, but there is two extra dungeons, one at the, like, end of the game that's, like, a secret dungeon with the super boss. Yeah, and that's actually how you get Clavis back after she dies. Um, and we'll touch on kind of the story significance of, you know, why we're able to get her back from the dead later, but, um... Yeah, like right before the final boss, you get an item that takes you into um, an extra dungeon called the Mysterious Unison, which is just several floors of kind of these labyrinthine uh, paths. And uh, there's more reskins of prior bosses um, as you go farther and farther down. And yeah, we've got a little bit more of the cemetery to run through if we have any more donations. Absolutely. Um, also, I cannot unhear Terriermon from Pete's voice. Good, Thank excellent. <laughs> yeah, a couple <laughs> couple donations here. Um, I have a hundred dollars from Ralkun who leaves a heart comment. Thank you so much for that generous donation. And we have a twenty-five dollar donation from Miria who says, "Bah." <laughs> Is it possible that we're going to see any more goats in the run? Yes, we definitely are. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, throughout the marathon, if you donate a total of $100, you'll be eligible for a grand prize, which is the 256 gigabyte Steam Deck, um, to see the different prizes, uh, such as the Chrono Cross prizes that was mentioned earlier. You can check out our tracker on the RPG Limit Break website, which you can find in the link in the bio section. And also on the website, you can find the schedule uh, for the remainder of the event. You all definitely want to get in for that Steam Deck, too. I bought one right when it came out, and I've loved it ever since. I get so much use out of it. It's an amazing piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. 
So I didn't mention it yet either, but this enemy or this uh, area introduces a new uh, enemy type called antiques, which are these kind of little floating key looking things. Um, their kind of awkward gimmick as far as getting around them in the overworld is that they don't have a very clear indication of which direction they're facing because all they do is kind of just spin around. Um, the only way you can really tell which way they're facing is if they're moving. Otherwise, you kind of just have to gamble and try to run by them and hope that they don't see you. Um, because they all do react pretty heavily to um, you being in their line of sight. Thankfully, you don't have to deal with them too, too much. Um, but they are really annoying whenever you do have to deal with them. So yeah, we're passing right by the boss door here. That's the save point right in front of the boss door. You gotta take this green flame all the way back around just so we can get through a gate that's right up here. <laughs> so if we could take a blue flame with us or, you know, get through that green gate and the blue gate, like there's so many different possibilities of potentially breaking this area and just none of them have proved fruitful yet. Much to my chagrin. Would you like a Chopin fact? Yes. All right, I've got one ready. Um, one that's a little morbid again, fitting for a graveyard. So at the end of the game, and actually throughout some of the cutscenes in the game where you're actually seeing like Chopin like on his deathbed with like, there's a doctor there and there are some other people in the room. Um, one is his sister and another is actually his student. And these were people that were in his room um, in real life. So at the end of the game, you see this woman in the room start like singing this song in, I believe, Italian. Um, in real life, his this is his student, and she actually sang the Polish na national anthem um, when he died. Chopin Bax. <laughs> All right, so we're coming up on the next boss here. Uh, just did a quick little menu there to put on some more healing items, um, give our characters the new equipment that we bought in Andante. Um, and this next boss is called Death Crow. Um, it's also going to be accompanied by some ads. So we're going to be skipping Falsetto's first turn, and those ads will always clump up on her. Uh, we're going to be using Falsetto to mostly finish them off. Um, again, Viola is going to move away so that she can um, get into a good position for her arrows. And then we're going to basically be using Allegretto as um, an Echo Builder and a healer uh, for the entirety of this fight. Um, this is also a fight where we're going to be using the one Glowing Tail we bought. Um, Falsetto's Light Special is a lot better than her Dark Special at this point of the game. Um, so we're going to be using a Glowing Tail on her so that she can use her Light Special as much as possible. And ideally, we're going to be beating the fight before it runs out because it does have a duration, as do the Hell Mustards, actually. Something that's important to note, too, as far as just kind of a risk factor on fights is that um, any item that applies a buff that's visible on the enemy's health bar, or on the ally's health bar, um, will go away if the character dies. Um, and that can work much to our detriment um, because we only can bring so many into a fight. Um, I didn't really touch on it, but the way that bringing items into fights works is that you're only allowed to bring as many items as you have um, points. And every item sort of has an associated point value. And as we go through the game and get more party level ups, we're able to bring more items into uh, battle with us. Um, so, like, generally, like, the Club Clovers that have um, kind of AoE healing properties are going to be worth more points than the single target healing items like the Cookies. So, Falsetto got a weird status effect here. Um, I don't remember what it's called, but it drastically reduces your turn time. It kind of, like, locks you in place for a while. And actually, I kind of forgot this fight could even do that to you. It's been so long since this even happened. So this fight's going swimmingly. Um, yeah, this boss can also revive its adds, unfortunately. So yeah, this is uh, not great, actually. Again, Falsetto just really cannot move very much. So it's eating a lot of our turns of our buffs. So we're going to be hoping Viola is just going to do enough damage to kind of make up the difference here. And the boss is blocking, which is fantastic. I guess this is a good excuse for our marathon. That's never happened before. We got our one, so hopefully there aren't any more. All 
gonna have to top it off here. Yeah, we're definitely gonna be doing most of our damage with Viola here. I actually legitimately don't remember if this debuff expires on its own. It's been so long since I've even seen it. I think it does. And yeah, that ate so much time, it just completely burned through Falsetto's uh, Hell Mustard and Glowing Tail turns. Yeah, we're basically just going to be healing on Falsetto's turns now and just letting Viola finish this off. Um, so something that would normally be more relevant in this fight is um, the weapon that Falsetto has on right now can apply a status condition called Slow. Um, that really doesn't do anything as far as the boss is concerned, but it will put the boss in its sort of low health animation um, where it will hang its head down, which is the only way that Viola is able to get headshots on this boss. Otherwise, his hitbox is far too high for her to reach. Um, so that's a nice little way you can save time, but definitely not getting that here. Kind of leaving Allegretto in place here just to keep the boss where it is because it is in a decent spot right now. This boss also has really weird hitboxes. You might be noticing too, I generally keep uh, fights in the uh, overhead camera perspective just because it's a lot easier for me to kind of see what's going on. Um, depth perception and spacing your party members can be really difficult in this game. Um, so making it as easy as possible is definitely to your uh, benefit. Perfect. It was not perfect, well set up. <laughs> it's always <laughs> really awful when you're having a bad run and the characters just like make you feel so much worse for having a bad run. You'll, you'll just be streaming this game and be like, dang, that fight was really, really bad and Falsetto was just, that was perfect. No, sorry, it wasn't. All right, so now we get to switch back to our other party who, when they got knocked off the bridge, they got rescued by um, essentially the friendly royalty of Baroque, um, Prince Crescendo and Princess Serenade. However, um, our rescue is quickly interrupted by a pirate ship um, captained by uh, Dolce, who is a significant difficulty spike in both versions of this game. Um, definitely a very, very brutal part of the game, partially just because she's really, really strong. But her AI is really devious, and we're kind of stuck with the, as I mentioned before, not so great party. Um, so we're kind of using some characters with worse tools in order to deal with her. <clears throat> so we have a little bit of a kind of pirate ship maze segment here, and then we're gonna run into Dolce. Doing a little bit of menuing there. We got some new weapons and some new armor uh, for our party there. We have one fixed fight here um, that we're gonna have to go into. Um, this is gonna go by pretty quick. Uh, we're gonna build echoes with uh, Salsa's first turn. This is our first time really using Salsa, by the way. Um, we're gonna build echoes on Salsa's first turn and then use Beat to finish off the bottom pirate and then Salsa will finish off the right pirate. There's some slight variance into this uh, fight as far as whether Frederick or Beat get uh, a turn first, but it largely plays out at the same speed. Also, enjoy the uh, funny pirate voice lines. So something that hopefully won't come up um, with Beat's special attack as well is that it actually has slightly different properties if you use it from too far away, um, because obviously aiming from farther away is difficult. Um, his special will only do three slower hits that are weaker if you're too far away. So that's kind of why I moved um, a lot closer to the enemy there before I started shooting. He's been actually really mean to me recently. Usually he'll just stare at the stairs and see you through the railing and you just have to keep reloading the screen until he cooperates. 
These pirates are also really, really funny. fast as well. Go ahead. What were you? Yeah, doing? I do think it's funny. Um, your party decides to raid the pirate ship that is trying to raid their ship. So you're going onto their ship instead of them coming onto yours to get rid of them. Very bold. Ooh, okay. All right, buddy. We're just going to reload you. So this enemy, you kind of have to, like, try to peek at around this chair and hope he isn't in a bad spot. Because if he is facing you there, he will see you the instant you can see him. So you have to really, really quickly pull back and try to reset him. It's definitely the scariest enemy in this section. A lot of them you can kind of just breeze past if they see you otherwise like that, though. Yeah, these have largely been in a good spot. So yeah, we're kind of going through all this labyrinth just to get to a key that'll allow us to unlock the door to where Dolce is. And that NPC on the right that we just fell past is actually who we used to give the score piece to um, for the dark brooch. Um, but yeah, we don't do that anymore. So he uh, just gets to hang out by himself now, I guess. All right, so this fight is a little bit more serious, so I'm going to let Cassie explain it, and I'm going to kind of shut up and focus here. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> so um, this is Dolce, the captain of the ship. So she's got two um, enemies with her, one that is the stronger version pirate, which is like the blonde hair on the right, and then one that's the lower level um, side pirate. So, yeah, during this fight, um, Dolce just kind of does a lot of very quick attacks, some that you have to block quickly, some that you have to wait several seconds um, to guard, which can be pretty tricky. And the other really hard part about this fight is uh, Dolce is one of the first um, boss encounters where she will actively go behind you. So you... Like uh, Oro mentioned earlier, you have to be facing enemies to guard accurately. Um, so if an enemy goes behind you, you press guard and it will make your character turn around, but you're not actually going to guard until the next chance um, when the enemy attacks. So there's a lot of attacks if she goes behind you that you can't guard off the bat. So that's kind of one of the big difficulty spikes starting with this boss encounter. And you're seeing that right there, unfortunately. Did you enjoy that? And I can explain what Shadow Silhouette does. So that's Salsa's uh, dark special. So what that does is put a buff on um, the characters nearby her for basically the next special um, that is used to be powered up a little bit. So Oro's got both of the side pirates um, dead now, but there is a chance that Dolce can revive them, but hopefully she doesn't. And that attack, Dead Man's Tail, that's like the, the worst attack um, that Dolce can use because it's such a long buildup and it's incredibly powerful. It will take a lot of your health bar away if you don't um, block it properly. This is also the first boss that can kind of... So enemies have attack strings, sort of like nice. your characters do, um, where they'll kind of do batches of like a, you know, one hit, two hit, three hit kind of thing. Um, but 
they can kind of cancel the first hit or the first you know couple hits of a combo into just repeating the first hit over and over again. So you really have to be ready to just repeatedly block the first hit potentially. And um, if you miss that first block, you can kind of get what I was talking about earlier, where you just like can't block any of the rest of what they do. Um, and you just don't get much time to react to the tons of different things that bosses can do. And it can definitely whittle your health away really, really fast. And yeah, I was able to block every single one of them there, which thankfully was just really, really nice. But yeah, Dead Man's Tail will do about 90% of any of your character's health or just kill them outright. And it's it's really, really important. Um, this game also has a mechanic where if you block prematurely, your character will still do the animation of blocking, but you won't fully successfully block the attack. So you can kind of get um, punished for anticipating a faster hit, blocking, and then they do the slower attack with more windup, and you just get blown up by Dead Man's Tail or any other move that's similar. Um, the next boss also has another attack that's very similar to Dead Man's Tail. Um, did you talk about Salsa's hat? Oh, no. So Salsa lost her hat <laughs> when uh, the party got knocked off the bridge by Tuba. Um, and she gets a new hat from uh, the treasure chest that was in Dolce's room. Um, and funnily enough, the um, boss track for Dolce is actually called Seize the Artifact for Tallness. So Salsa has a twin sister named March, um, who's basically her, but blue. Um, and she likes wearing hats because she likes to feel taller than March does. Um, so she definitely felt <laughs> really insecure without her hat when she got knocked off the bridge. But now she's got a brand new hat. She's feeling a lot better. She's an honorary pirate. Everything's hunky-dory with her. She also feels the need to be taller than Beat. <laughs> yeah, Beat and her have a really good dynamic throughout the story. They're both pretty young kids, and they kind of get at each other for that, and it's it's fun. It's fun. It's also just has some really weird voice lines. She's, like, southern for some reason, and has a lot of voice lines about pounding people, and she just... And sending people into flying spins. Yeah, she's, she's great. We love Salsa. It's also great on nachos, but... Her weapons are really good, too, with the um, double hits. Yeah, so she and Salsa both use um, Chakrams as weapons, and they're really, really good at building Echoes. The Salsa and March are both some of the best characters in the game. Um, a lot of kind of what makes a character good in this game is almost entirely down to how well they build Echoes, unless their name is Falsetto, and then Falsetto is just triple S god tier just better than almost every other character in the game for a myriad of reasons and we'll kind of get to those as we get later in the run as well yeah a lot of the worst characters in the game just don't really build echoes very fast and unfortunately they don't have specials to make up for kind of how slowly they accrue echoes So running through this area, we got to deal with more antiques. Um, and one little fun thing I like to point out on uh, this area is there's a weird graphical bug with this like kind of heat filter they put over uh, the screen here. And you can see on the right, it looks like the screen is tearing. And I have to assume it's just some weird offset in the kind of effect that they overlaid on the screen. And I believe it's still there on the PS3 version. I actually don't recall 100%. Yeah, again, these enemies are really hard to deal with because we just can't tell what direction they're facing. We kind of just have to hope that we don't get punished for just trying to run past them. They also have really weird vision radiuses. Like, there's a lot of times where you think you can pass them and they just turn around on a dime and get you anyway. This enemy is always here, um, but thankfully we get to run away right away. Um, this game does have um, a back attack mechanic where if you walk into uh, the rear of a character or an enemy or if they walk into your back, um, your characters will get turned around um, and the enemy will get a turn first and vice versa. Um, so it's really, really bad uh, if you get back attacked surely because one, you don't run away right away. Um, so you have to sit through a lot of animations. Um, but as we talked about earlier too, you can only block things that you're facing. So you're gonna take a lot of extra damage by you know, sitting there trying to turn around and hoping that your characters respond. 
The turning around when you press the guard button when you're not facing an enemy is not exactly super responsive. Um, so you're kind of just at the game's mercy as far as that's concerned. Um, I believe this area in Wall Lava Cave, so the boss fight we just did, Dolce, you can actually re-fight her two times. And I think this cave is where you can find her again for the first time. Yes. Yeah, and she gets progressively harder each and every time. And uh, strangely enough, there's... So we mentioned the New Game Plus mode in this game before. There's one boss that's um, New Game Plus exclusive, and it's just a bread gang reskin, and you fight it in the mountain that we were just at. Um, you'd think they do something a little bit more grandiose for a New Game Plus new boss, but it's just kind of random reskin of the first boss. A lot of the other um, monster bosses in the game will get reskins later. Um, we kind of have a refight section near the end of the game. Um, but Bread Gang is the only one that otherwise gets left out, so they had to get him in there somewhere. So doing another quick menu here to set up for the next boss. Um, we're only bringing one Hell Mustard in here. We're basically just going to be putting it on beat, and we should kill the boss before um, it expires. Um, we actually used to poison this boss, but it involved bringing like five poison white caps into the fight to make it even remotely consistent. And it left you with almost no healing for the fight, which left it super, super scary. And your odds of poisoning him were extremely low. At the end of the day, it kind of just ended up being better to not only be safer, but also just kind of skip the poison because it just did not happen that often and really didn't do a whole lot for you. Um, we're kind of able to just out damage the percentage damage that poison deals um, as a status effect. Uh, we also picked up in that chest an item called the Celestial Hourglass. So they're really, really rare consumables that you can bring into battle. And when you use it in battle, it extends your turn timer, uh, which seems slightly awkward because you have to waste time to use an item that gives you more time. Um, but it just barely gives you enough time to um, shave some turns in a later fight if you get a good turn uh, set up. And it's it's right there in the path, so it's a really easy pickup. Another item that, you know, we kind of just walked by and didn't use for years and years and years, and then Wasude Mono's run made use of it, and it's like, hey, I forgot this item exists. That's pretty good. This is another fight I'm going to kind of shut up and focus, so if you want to explain anything, Cassie, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we're basically fighting uh, Ichigo Kurosaki, uh, I mean Fugue, um, for this fight. So he is once again, like, <laughs> kind of like Dolce, where he's got some really hard hits, some um, specials that are really drawn out, like this one, where you don't block until uh, quite a few seconds into the, into the attack, but... Yeah, Fug is just, he loves to run around the entire arena, which is not great. And he loves to go behind your characters, which is also not great. Definitely one of the harder bosses in the game. Yeah. Yeah, enemies can move around in really, really funny ways when they just want to get into the position they want to be in. I thought he was going to run around beat there. I was not ready for him to go after Frederick. It's also really hard to anticipate block timing when the enemies move around like that. Ah, that's not great. Very 
Yeah. Yeah, sometimes, um, bosses will do specials that will knock you down if you don't block them. And then if they start another one while your character is getting back up, you just, like, can't block at all. Not quite. Yeah, there's some enemies that if they knock down a character, they actually, like, their AI kind of freaks out and they'll either switch targets or just stop attacking you entirely. But the better AI bosses will um, definitely not let up. So we're actually going to leave Frederick dead here. Um, we're not going to use him anymore. You don't usually, like, try to end the fight with him dead here. But if it works out, it works out, like right here. Um, it basically just skips his animations of leveling up because we don't care about him anymore, unfortunately. Um, you know, the main focus of the game, we're just not going to use him anymore. Yeah, saved a little bit of time on no level up animation there. I was going to say, um, do you know, like, why bosses pick certain characters to attack? So I'm not super 100% on it, but what it seems to be is that they'll tr kind of prioritize characters they think they can either finish off or deal the most damage to. A lot of times they seem to, especially in like the mid game, they'll try to focus Beat, who usually has like the Hell Mustard buff on him, uh, which increases the damage he takes. And he's just kind of generally the squishier character that we have. Um, but that rule doesn't always, um, that isn't always the case. So I'm not exactly sure how their aggro works. Um, but there's, you know, there's certain instances where enemies will always do the same thing. And I really, at the end of the day, just don't know why. I just know that it works. So now our parties have reconvened. Um, and we're in the only section that we get to play as a character other than Allegretto or Polka in the field. Um, unfortunately, this is not a game where you can pick who you control in the overworld, which makes has always made me really, really sad. Um, yeah, it, it's a nice change of pace here to get to control beat for sure. So we got a little hallway here with uh, four different enemy fights. Um, one of them we can squeeze past by running away from it. Um, so we're going to have to fight the other three. Each one of these fights can have either two or three enemies. Um, so obviously we're going to hope for getting two. Um, and we can pretty easily finish them off with a uh, Salsa turn and a March turn and a Viola turn. Uh, if we get an extra enemy, Viola can really easily finish it off. Um, yeah, definitely waste time to get an extra enemy. Um, this next fight here too, Viola is going to hit level 20, which is a really important threshold for her because she's going to get a special attack, a dark special attack called Hawkeye. Um, and much like Shadow Silhouette, which Cassie explained earlier, it's going to buff um, our damage by quite a lot. However, it doesn't buff the characters that you're using. It debuffs the enemy, um, which gives it a lot different applications. So it's still consumed as soon as you use a special attack like Shadow Silhouette is. Um, and that's going to be like the main thing we're doing with it still. Um, however, it increases all damage you deal to the enemy, regardless of whether it's a special attack or not. Um, and there is a fight later we're going to be using just normal attacks and taking advantage of that Hawkeye debuff the entire time to deal a bunch of extra damage. Um, the last party level we got to from beating Fugue also gave us access to a new mechanic called Harmony Chains. Um, so the way Harmony Chains work is every character has two slots for their light and dark specials. And you can assign which special you want in either of those slots. Um, if you have two different um, moves in your two different slots, you can chain them together if you spend uh, 24 or 32 echoes on your chain. Um, and it basically just links the two together. Um, there's a glitch in this game, which is really the only like helpful glitch in combat um, that we call reverse chains. Um, and basically the way that that works is the game kind of intends you to begin your chain with a special that has a lot of hits um, because it's going to scale better off of um, the echoes you're spending because you only get the bonus off of the first um, special in the chain. However, if you start the chain with a special with one uh, with three or fewer hits, um, it maintains that damage bonus from the echoes you consume for the uh, second hit of the chain as well. And since Hawkeye is a single hit and also applies a debuff, a very, very strong debuff. Um, we're able to very quickly apply Hawkeye and get a lot of benefit out of it um, all in one um, chain using that mechanic. Um, and we're gonna use it uh, with Falsetto once we switch to using her as the main damage dealer later, but 
Um, it's very nice with uh, with uh, Viola with uh, Hawkeye. Yeah, I've got a little bit more uh, time for donations before the next boss, if you've got any for us. Sure thing. We have $100 from Duolf, who says, any plan where you lose your hat is a bad plan. Glad <laughs> to see Salsa got hers back. Mm. Last time I checked, the uh, Lufia 2 major glitches um, for the incentive, we were at 600 out of 1,000. We're very close to we are currently at 852 out of a thousand so we're really close to hitting that incentive so if you want to see lufia 2 beat in under five minutes very close to hitting that and of course we have some other uh incentives for that particular game such as naming the main character naming the capsule monster so let's get those don donations in for those incentives all right, so here we have our next boss, Root Lurker. Um, so, like I said, we're gonna get to see that reverse chain uh, mechanic in action. Uh, this is the last fight we're gonna have to use uh, Hell Mustards because this boss is going to give us the accessory I alluded to earlier that's gonna allow us to um, just have that status active at all times. Unfortunately, this boss is like Forest Boar and has a really annoying charging mechanic that uh, it decided to use right away, which is gonna mess up our turn tempo here. Uh, this is actually really awkward. Okay, kind of fixed things here. So, both of Viola's specials that we want to be using here are dark specials. So, we need to kind of use this boss's shadow as our um, point of reference for where to get her to. And unfortunately, if the boss is kind of facing into its own shadow, we just have to hope that it's not going to block our attacks. But generally here, we're just building to 32 Echoes and uh, finishing it off with hopefully two uh, Reverse Chains. And yeah, here we're getting to see just how well uh, March can build Echoes, even compared to Salsa, who's also really good at it. And this boss is really, really tight on damage, so hitting it a couple more times there just to try to ensure that we finish it off in two chains and we got it, so that's good. A little bit of clunk at nice. the beginning there because of the dash, but overall pretty good. So we're all gonna wind up back in Baroque now, which is the um, kind of snow city we were briefly in before. Um, at this point, we're um, kind of trying to work with uh, the prince and princess of Baroque to um, kind of counteract what Waltz is doing. Um, and Falsetto is kind of off on her own at, some, uh, at this point. Um, and the dungeon we're heading to now is, um, we're basically just going there because we are trying to find Falsetto and we, we think we saw her going there. Um, and then we get to the end and the person we realized where we thought was falsetto is not falsetto and is another person who's out to kill us um but then falsetto comes to save us so she was actually there the whole time and we were definitely not wrong still yeah falsetto gets um really emotional when claves dies and just kind of leaves the party for a while because she doesn't want to face jazz basically with claves gone um, and this tower that you end up going to in Baroque where you meet back up with Falsetto. So you hear this legend from this priest about um, like the legend of the Astra, which is like the light that shines in your heart and reflects. I don't know. It's some like mumbo jumbo this game. <laughs> um, like really doesn't make a lot of sense, but the PS3 version once again explains it better. Um, and we want to know more about this legend, so we kind of do this little, uh, like, get the key for this wizard who has the key for the tower back and forth um, to get up to the top of this tower where we happen to run into another assassin and falsetto, like Oro said. This is another nice area with some really peaceful music that's just really, really comfy. 
Um, so coming up here, we're going to be getting an item called the Spellbook, which is what we're going to trade into um, that mage for the key. Um, and this is actually like a very, very small skip, I guess. This game doesn't have a ton of glitches or anything, but um, it has some cute stuff like this. So there's an enemy blocking the chest, um, and you're intended to, you know, kill the enemy so you can get to the chest. However, we can kind of abuse um, the mechanic I mentioned earlier where you interact with something and then the character kind of moves into position to finish interacting with it. Um, so we can interact with the edge of the chest and it'll kind of walk us in front of the chest and open the chest. We'll still get into the encounter with the enemy, um, but it allows us to just like run away from it and get away instead of having to finish it off. And thankfully this counts as a back attack even though both of our backs are facing each other. Thankfully for back attacks, it doesn't really check whether you're facing their back. It just checks that you're coming into contact with their back. It's, it's very, very weird, but it works out pretty well in this scenario. And yeah, we're going to be doing a little bit more backtracking and walking to turn in the uh, book for the key and then coming back here to go into Arya Temple. So if you've got any more Chopin facts for us... I do have one. Um, Chopin actually had really small hands for a piano player. Um, and he had custom pianos built for him where the keys were slightly smaller than your average piano. And I believe to this day, there are still three pianos in existence in, existence, um, in different places in Europe that were Chopin's pianos that you can go and see. So we're taking a quick detour in this backtrack here to not only say hi to some nice doggos, um, but in order to get this uh, feathered hat. So there's two items that we're gonna get in the run called the feathered hat and the bubbly hat that um, they increase our speed by 5% and 10% respectively on whoever you have them on. Um, this is largely used to not only run away from enemies um, more consistently, uh, just to make sure we're faster than them, but it also kind of syncs up the turn order in such a way where our characters are going in the sequence that we want. For the rest of the game, we're largely going to want Viola to go first, so she can set up Hawkeye, and then March so that she can build Echoes, and then Falsetto so that she can spend them. Um, and a lot of times we'll get like a setup turn with Falsetto to use some items at the start of that as well. Um, speed is a little weird in this game, so it doesn't follow a perfect, you know, the fastest character goes first, and then the second fastest, and then the third, and so on. Um, there's kind of what I interpret as ranges around all of their speed values. So it's kind of like a, a weird speed Venn diagram where they can kind of overlap on each other and beat people out um, when they're actually slower than someone else. Um, but if you kind of get the gap between their speeds large enough, you can get the turn order to behave how you want it to. Also, this guy has a really nice, huge book of music. It's very, very big. Also, interestingly, too, so we mentioned that there are cutscenes throughout the game where it's it's still in anime, um, like, game engine looks, but it's, you know, the real world um, in Chopin's room as he's dying. And this mage looks exactly like his doctor. Um, there's not really any, like story given significance to this guy being identical to his doctor, but he is. I wonder if they just use the same character model. It's probably as simple as that, but. <laughs> they do kind of try to draw some like loose analogs between characters in his life and characters in the game, but it's not really, um, super, super directly explained. It's kind of just me pulling it out of nothing. Um, but there is a, also a striking, striking resemblance between um, one of the characters in his room and uh, Polka's mother as well. Yeah, I think the only like direct person is Polka being like Chopin's little sister. But yeah, otherwise, there are some characters that look similar to each other in different places. Uh, 
Um, also, we could explain, so the um, prince and princess of Baroque, Serenade, and what's the other guy's name? Crescendo. Crescendo. So Serenade is actually another one of Count Waltz's spies. And they kind of come up with this plot to, um, you know, go against Count Waltz and Serenade is like really against it obviously trying not to give away that she's a spy um but crescendo like kind of figures it out but again they're like going to be married and they like love each other so it's kind of another one of these like claves deals where there's emotions also interacting with the the spyiness the ulterior of the scenario motives. yeah yeah, that's another um, thing that's different about the PS3 version as well, is there's two extra playable characters, and it's Crescendo and Serenade. Um, Crescendo isn't great. Serenade is pretty okay. Um, yeah, Crescendo kind of suffers from just having a really clunky normal attack animation, and he's really bad at building echoes. He was kind of this game trying to give you, like, a tank class that this game just doesn't really need. It unfortunately just doesn't kind of really mesh with the way the combat works. Um, and Serenade is kind of general, like more supportive, kind of a mage um, kind of deal. But she has she has a lot of spells that are um, pretty useful. And she's pretty fun to use. So We've got a quick little dungeon run here, and then we've got our next boss, who is Rondo. Um, as we said before, she's another one of um, Waltz's henchmen, essentially, who's out to try to stop us from stopping him. Um, and this is going to be the last fight where we really use Viola for damage. Um, we're going to be setting up a Hawkeye on her, and then um, just pushing her as far away as we can, and still reasonably hitting her, and then just uh, sniping her with Viola's bow. Um, this boss illustrates kind of a weird thing with the interaction between Hawkeye and Viola's shots. So Hawkeye will put the enemy in their like debuffed slouched over animation. And whenever you hit an enemy with an attack, it kind of resets them back to a standing position. So we not only have to hit a small target here with Viola, but we have to aim in such a way that we're gonna hit the boss while she's slouched over and while she's standing up which can be really, really difficult on this fight. And we actually don't bring her to the full range of where Viola's damage bonus will go, just because hitting her is nearly impossible if you go too far. Actually, you're meant to menu here to outspeed these enemies, and it just completely crossed my mind. But We're going to go ahead and do that now. I'm also going to be putting on the Crimson Brooch. And we're all set on items. So. Yeah, so we're putting those speed items on March uh, for now. We're going to be moving them around characters a lot just because the character we need that speed on will vary quite a lot. But um, we also need to do this because I forgot that in practice and it was ugly. Um, so basically the way that characters entering your party um, as a fight starts works is the first character in your menu is the middle slot, the second character is the bottom, the third character is the top. When you get a character added to your party outside of um, your menu, like through a cutscene or something, um, they'll get put in the first slot and then your first two characters will get shoved back. So we kind of need to like anticipate where a character is going to enter our party and where the rest of our party is going to land as a result. So we're gonna have Falsetto in the uh, middle here and then March on the bottom, Viola on the top. So we're going to be using an item called Lion's Manes here for the first time. And basically what they do is give a stackable 10% attack boost to whoever they're on. Uh, and you can stack them up to four times. We only need to stack three here to get the damage we want. Um, but we are going to stack three of them on Viola. Um, she also has a piece of equipment on her called a Power Ring, which basically just gives us a free stack of it. As well as the Crimson Brooch that's giving us the Hell Mustard buff. Um, automatically now. It also has no duration, so we no longer have to worry about sort of running out of Hell Mustard turns. Ha! 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 
And there was an instance of me just getting locked out of blocking. Thank you. Thank you. That was an excellent fight. So I didn't want to jinx it and say it before she did it, but that fight can go colossally wrong. She can randomly decide to go after Violo and we're trying to space them out. And the only way to fix it is either pray that she goes back down, which is very rare, or just let Viola die and then revive her and then kind of reset everything. And if you have to do that, it wastes a ton, a ton of time and you're just completely at Rondo's mercy. But that was basically a perfect fight. That was excellent. So we're heading back to the castle in Baroque to kind of wrap up a couple cutscene things uh, here. And then we're going to be getting a key that will take us to a teleporter room um, that will kind of take us to our eventual end goal to stop Count Waltz, which is at Mount Rock, which is where they're um, mining all the minerals for the mineral powder. Um, so this is kind of our culmination of finally going to fight Count Waltz and try to put an end to everything he's doing. Uh, we have a pretty lengthy dungeon, though, before that, uh, which is called Dakota Ruins, which is aptly named because it's taking us to the end of the game. Um, and yeah, if you don't know what a coda is in music, um, there are certain portions of songs that will kind of repeat um, a section of um, the music, and there will be a marker that denotes going to the coda, and then the coda is the ending section of the piece. Um, so very, very aptly named area here. And it's funny because when we, we go to the teleporter and the teleporter gives us a menu prompt to go to Tukota Ruins and it just, it reads really funny. I always get a kick out of it. In one of the cutscenes here too, we kind of find out, um, so Crescendo finds out that Serenade is basically a spy and they both kind of agree like, well, Instead of trying to assassinate Count Waltz, like let's just go and go and ask him if maybe he'll stop if we surrender ourselves um, as the leaders of Baroque. So we're kind of chasing after them um, to go and fight Count Waltz instead. So we don't want them to uh, to perish. <laughs> no, they're nice people. They've taken care of us so far. Yeah, and we are suspect of Waltz enough that he probably won't have any mercy, which he doesn't. Yeah, he's very, very maniacal, as we're going to hear with his laughter. So we have another rather lengthy dungeon that can get very confusing casually. Um, there's kind of all these teleporters and broken up islands here, and it's really hard to kind of tell where you are. Um, but if you're just kind of blitzing through and going to the end, it's pretty easy to find your way. But getting all the items here can definitely be rather arduous. Do a little bit of menuing here. the right things on the right people here. Um, so we gave uh, March some items that I've had on people earlier and haven't really touched on. They're just uh, some items to make her a little bit tankier because we don't have anything else to really do with her accessory slots. Um, we're moving the feathered hat and the bubbly hat over to Viola because we don't need them on falsetto anymore. And then we're moving the power ring and the crimson brooch over to falsetto so that she's doing as much damage as possible. Um, we also switched uh, Falsetto specials around here. So we switched to Shadow Beam and Night Fist in the first slots, which are uh, specials that meet that condition of being three or fewer hits. Um, Night Fist also has an additional property where it's kind of a giant projectile, and we can use that to multi-hit things like we did with uh, Allegretto's Phantom Wave at the beginning of the game. And it allows us to double hit things and get some collateral damage on a boss fight that involves two uh, enemies. Um, and then we also switched her second dark 
uh, special to Howling Thunder, which is just a dark version of Snowclaw, which is the light special we've been using with her for quite a while now. Um, a lot of characters learn sets for their what levels they get um, their different specials. They end up with, generally speaking, a light and a dark version of all of their specials. So you can kind of have a symmetrical move set if you want to, um, but they do have a couple uh, specials that end up being exclusive to either side. Um, but we're largely going to be taking that kind of mirrored approach just for the sake of consistency. And they're just really good specials to be using at this point of the game. I have never seen that enemy that close to the jump off point. <laughs> Thankfully, this game's pretty good about um, not screwing you over as far as enemies seeing you in situations that you're locked into an animation. We're also at a point in the game where a lot of these areas are rather spacious and we kind of have a lot of room to move around enemies and they, a lot of them are just really passive at this point. It really is weird how much easier enemies get to avoid later in, or enemies are to avoid later in the game. It is kind of nice though, to have like the first half of the game where you're stressing really hard over enemies hitting you and getting all these encounters and then later in the game and you're just kind of like able to chill and take a step back and breathe. Definitely appreciated. Especially if your run gets on a good pace and you kind of just don't want to deal with enemies being rude anymore. To meet you. So we've got two required encounters here and they go really, really fast. Okay, well that was an instance of um, another glitch in combat that is not beneficial. Um, really just refer to it as echo glitch. Um, if you're in a spot where you're too far from the enemy and the game doesn't really correctly register that you're hitting it, um, it will fail to consume your echoes when you go to use your special attack, and it just wastes a ton, a ton of time because you're just not doing as much damage as you should, and you just need to wait a whole another turn cycle to do whatever you were planning on doing. Thankfully there, it's not a huge deal, but there are bosses later where um, if it happens, you lose a ton of time. Usually it's your own fault because you're not in a good position to hit them and it's kind of just the game punishing you for it. But it does kind of happen some random times where you aren't expecting it and you lose a lot of time to it and it sucks. So we've got another few minutes of dungeon here left if uh, we have any more donations to read off. Actually, perfect timing because we do have a special donation. We have a $500 donation. Oh, wow. From Mershon. <laughs> Mershon says, one of my favorite games from my childhood that helped me discover how much I liked RPGs. Got me to branch out to, into Tales, Star Ocean, and others. Such a unique premise and world with the great combat system. Thank you so much for reminding me of the joy and inspiration this game brought. Thank you so much for your donation. Yeah, that is awesome. Every single time I hear someone say how much they love this game or, you know, just even say they know what this game is, it brings me so much joy because it's a relatively niche game and just hearing that other people like this game just is really, really awesome. There's a, definitely a very vocal minority that has wanted a sequel to this game or some kind of follow-up to this game for a long time and it's it's a weird feeling because i think this game stands really well on its own but it's also just really interesting to think about what they would do with this premise if they did it again if they would do you know another musician or just do kind of its own thing or it, it's just really fun to think about what would happen and yeah like i said at the start of the run too i think this game kind of exists in a weird space at the start of the 360s lifespan where, you know, a lot of people like me hadn't really gotten into JRPGs outside of Pokemon and stuff um, too much. Um, and it was kind of just a weird age where we weren't really into that yet. And, you know, the console not doing super well in Japan. Um, and actually because of Cassie, uh, Blue Dragon is a game that I ended up going back to and playing um, after we met. And there's another game that's kind of in this category that I ended up loving a lot. And if you guys didn't end up watching Palmer's run earlier in the marathon, I highly recommend you go back and do so. Cause that game is also a, a terrific speed run. Yeah, shout outs to Palmer. Love Blue Dragon.
So we've got a little bit more buildup. We're going to be going through Mount Rock, which is where um, the resources for the mineral powder is being mined from. Uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of a shop here, and then we're going to be fighting Waltz. Um, so if you want, Cassie, we've got some more time for maybe another Chopin fact. Hmm. If you haven't run out by now. I'm getting pretty low, but um, I think you mentioned so... Um, Sakuraba is the composer of this game, um, as well as many other games, including some in the Tales series. Um, and in Tales of Vesperia, actually, there is a DLC outfit where you can dress like Chopin. And I believe that was only in the PS3 version of Vesperia as well. I think that was another thing that was added yeah. to that version. I don't even know if it would made it to the English version. I feel like maybe it was just a Japanese version, but I could be totally wrong. Yeah, so this game and Vesperia both, again, another thing that they share is that um, there was kind of an agreement with Sony uh, at the time where games that were previously uh, console exclusive that wanted to port their game to PS3 had to add extra content to it in order to be put on the console. So that's why, like, Tales of Vesperia has extra content on PS3 and was released later. That's why this game is in that position. I believe there's a game that was on Wii that was in that position, too, that someone mentioned to me when I was talking about them earlier this week. Um, I don't remember what it's called, but, yeah, there were a few games that were kind of under that umbrella. So this next screen after this cutscene here, we have one of the few screens in the game that kind of have a movement-based gimmick. Uh, so there's a wind current that will blow us to the right and then a wind current that will kind of fight us uh, going back to the left. Um, and they kind of adjust the enemy AI accordingly. Uh, the path where you're kind of fighting the wind, the enemies are a lot less aggressive. But the path where you're going with the wind, the enemies are a lot more aggressive. Um, so we actually have to be pretty careful on this first stretch here because we actually move a little bit fast for the camera to keep up. And uh, depending on where the enemy is, um, we'll have to kind of react pretty quickly. Yeah, sorry, it's the screen after this. I always forget the screen exists for whatever reason. Every single run, I'm like, oh, the wind screen is next. And then Come on, let's go. these enemies are also really obnoxious. If they decide to, they can do a lot of damage. Um, these are just reskins of kind of the bird knights from the beginning of the game. Um, but they have like a spin attack that nearly one shots you if you don't block it. Hopefully we don't get any more encounters here. Kind of pausing for a second here to let the camera catch up. And then we can just breeze past these. And then we're fighting the it wind on the so way fast. back. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully you can just breeze past the enemies if they're in a good spot, but that first enemy is definitely a problem. Uh, there was a run I had, I think it was last week, where it was farther up the path than I had ever seen it. And I usually, you know, I'm used to kind of stopping at a certain point to look for it. And I just ran right into it. And I was like, oh, okay, that can happen. Good to know. And this is kind of a weird, all right, that worked out. Had to just hope he didn't run through his friend to get to me. All right, doing a little bit of menu menuing here. So we only need one Lion's Mane for this fight, and this is actually the fight where we're going to be using the uh, Celestial Hourglass if the stars align for it to be beneficial to do so. Sometimes the turn order doesn't work out to where it's actually beneficial, but it's a pretty easy pickup, and it saves a lot of time when it does become useful. Uh, we're also going to be making use of another poorly illustrated mechanic in this game, where if your first and second slots for your specials are different, you can actually hold the special button in order to use the second one by choice instead of the first one. And we're going to be using that to finish off the um, ad here for Count Waltz, which is Calamity Wilm, his giant dragon mount thing that also kind of looks like a turkey for some reason. <laughs> okay. 
I also love the interaction at the start of this fight where Waltz is just like evilly laughing at you and March is just nice to meet you. So we're going to set up our one Lion's Mane on Falsetto here. We're going to top March off and then turn her to face Fals uh, Waltz so that he doesn't go after anyone else, hopefully. That's not great, but it's fine because we're waiting for Viola's turn to set up Hawkeye here anyway, so we kind of have these buffer turns to work with. So this should be good setup for the Celestial Hourglass here. So yeah, the thing we're looking for here is to start Falsetto's turn with 16 Echoes. We're going to get to 10 hits or so, use the Hourglass, and then that's going to give us enough time to finish up to 32. It would be really nice if we could do this twice in the fight, but Celestial Hourglasses are extremely rare, so we got to make use of the one, and that's really it. That's fine. You get a lot of buffer time in this fight to kind of heal people and fix things if things go awry. Oops. Did not realize she was going next. Yeah, unfortunately we can't get to 16 Echoes in one turn here, so we're going to kind of have to buy time a little bit more. Actually really low rolled there. The damage here is also pretty tight, uh, like it was on Root Lurker, um, but we should be able to finish him off pretty easily here. Yeah, <laughs> he was very, very close. Yeah. <laughs> so Count Waltz is stopped. All is merry or not. Um, so after this fight, uh, Waltz kind of gets desperate and has his uh, right-hand man, Legato, uh, drink, uh, like, concentrated mineral powder. And it turns him into a giant dragon monster that just so happens to rip open a rift in space and time. Um, so we're going to basically take this giant rift to what more or less boils down to the afterlife. It's kind of like purgatory for people who were um, corrupted by the mineral powder. Um, so you're going to see these little glowing balls uh, floating around, and it's basically the essence of people who were um, affected by uh, the mineral powder that he created. Um, so this kind of begins a stretch of the end of the game where we're going to be refighting uh, reskins of the monster enemies that we fought early in the game. Um, the next dungeon is called Xylophone Tower, and we need to complete this in order to open a barrier to the actual final dungeon. Um, and these, this dungeon has a gimmick where you're kind of playing these Simon Says uh, xylophone puzzles as you go up, where you're gradually adding more and more to the piece of music that you're playing with the xylophone on the ground. And uh, this piece of music isn't super immediately recognizable, but it is, um, in essence, um, Nocturne, which is one of Chopin's uh, pieces. It cuts out a lot of the kind of fancier notes in between, um, but it gives you kind of the essence of the song at its heart. Um, but this is also a part that's kind of weird casually because if you aren't just blitzing through from puzzle to puzzle, um, you kind of it's easy to forget what the last part of the puzzle was. Um, and it kind of each step of it adds on um, more and more to what you previously did with the final one not showing you what you have played pre previously. It'll play the song, but it won't show you the keys light up. Um, so if you're playing this, um, you know, and you're saving and going to eat dinner or whatever, like breaking up your play session, it's really easy to lose track of, you know, kind of the stuff you had done previously. And for the longest time when I was playing this when I was younger, I did just that. And I didn't even like process the fact that it was like the same song adding on to itself. 
So like when it got to the final part of the puzzle where it doesn't light up the keys for you, I was like, you know, trying to do it by ear and it definitely made it a lot harder. Thankfully, I did have a lot of musical involvement as a kid, so it wasn't like super, super hard, but this definitely can be a little bit more obtuse if you aren't, um, you know, as musically inclined or invested. Uh, these puzzles are also really easy to mess up because the keys are really, really small and it's really hard to tell where your character is actually standing. So there's definitely runs on good pace where I have flubbed one of these puzzles. And if you flub it, you have to talk to the little sign again and entirely start it over, um, which wastes a lot of time, as you might imagine, as it just you know sits there and plays the song for you again. And of course, every single time I mess it up, it's on the third part that's the longest part because you know of course that would happen. Um, but yeah, we'll be we'll be careful and hopefully that won't happen. Also, a little bit of a warning here, if your ear is a little bit more sensitive to dissonant sounds, then uh, this section you might want to mute for. Um, these stairs are not, they don't sound great. <laughs> I'll put it that way. You've got this nice music in the background and then this kind of clashing xylophone key sound as you're walking up these stairs. <laughs> also, if you ever needed evidence that moving around the inner parts of a circle is faster. You're going to hear exactly that as we get to the end of the staircase. You're just going to hear the speed difference. Yeah, I had a feeling that was going to be too tight, but I kind of just had to go for it. So before this enemy here, uh, we're going to be re-equipping the feathered hat and the bubbly hat to falsetto. Um, there's five of these enemies called Black Golds as we go up the staircase. And unfortunately, we missed the first one. Um, but we're basically giving Falsetto these items because she's the fastest base speed character we have in the party. So we're going to make her as fast as possible to attempt to instant flee from these. Um, these are also one of the few times where we've gotten recently a mechanic called Counterattack, which you might have seen flash up when I'm uh, given a guard prompt up until this point. Um, but basically how that works is you can press the A button instead of the B button, and it will completely nullify the attack that you're being hit by and the entirety of the enemy's turn, which just sounds incredibly broken. You might be wondering why I'm not using that more. One, it's already hard to block things as it is, and having to press an entirely different button to do so is just really hard to react to. Um, but when you get a counterattack successfully, it also gives the character that counterattacked an instant free turn that's half the duration of a normal turn. Um, and unfortunately, that largely doesn't work to our benefit because there's not a whole lot you can do with a turn that short. Um, and it kind of just messes up the turn order and ruins the pace of the fight that you're in. Um, but in the case of running away from these black golds, if we're given a counterattack prompt, we can counterattack and then instantly run away with that free turn we're given. Because as I have mentioned before, running away works in a way where you have to hold the buttons the entire duration of a turn. It doesn't care how long that turn is. So if you have a shortened turn, you run away that much faster, which is really, really nice. Uh, these enemies are also really obnoxious because they can end their turns with this random animation of them spinning their hands around, and it just eats up like two or three seconds for basically no reason. So running away from these enemies is really, really nice. And if you get an instant flee from all of them, it saves like around 25 seconds, which is definitely worth uh, trying to avoid. Speaking of game mechanics, um, you can also play this game with two players in fights. <laughs> yeah, so even though this is a turn-based game, you can have each person controlling different characters and like taking turns uh, playing as them, which is kind of interesting. It's kind of a weirdly included mechanic, but it's it's there for you to do if you want to. And I'm actually not super knowledgeable about the Tales franchise myself, because I really haven't played them much. Um, but I believe the earlier ones, at least, have local co-op as well. So that's another slight similarity that these games have. I might be completely off on that, but I thought they did.
All right, so we've got one more batch of xylophone puzzle and then staircase and then circular room like this. And then we're going to get a dual boss with um, a reskinned ogre champ and a reskinned trick or treat. Um, and we're going to have to fight them at the same time. Uh, and this is where Night Fist is going to get a lot of utility because we're going to be aiming to finish them off one at a time. But using Night Fist to aim through both bosses and get some collateral damage on the second boss that we aren't taking out first. Uh, and that'll allow us a little bit easier of a time um, finishing it off. Let's make sure I don't step on the wrong keys here. All right, we did it. That definitely makes me a little because nervous. Like the day after I end up messing that up, I'm like nervous the whole day that I'm going to do it again. But we're good. I did mess it up once in practice while I was here at the event, but we did it. Hardest trick in the game. Oh, were you going to say Cassie? No, I was just going to say you played the music. Playing piano is hard. <laughs> It's really cool that this game like actually shows you the piano keys and like there's a lot of educational um a lot of educational opportunities in this game yeah one unfortunate thing with the educational cutscenes is it would be like a fun little bid war to do for a marathon but all the cutscenes get dmca'd and uh it's not fun for marathon vods so the only reason i know that is because there was one instance of me doing a speed run where I just like watched all the cutscenes and it was like, you know, it added like six hours to the run, but it was like a fun little thing to do. And the VOD ended up getting uh, muted, so that was fun. But yeah, if you ever play this game for yourself, it is, you know, a fun little thing to learn about Chopin while you're playing the game. Yeah, learning is fun. It, it definitely is. But yeah, it's just really nice sections of just listening to some good classical piano tunes and it's, it's a nice way to kind of unwind in between chapters, which is really nice. You got pretty good luck on those last couple black golds too, which is really, really nice. So one last menu there. Uh, I'm going to menu some extra healing items on after this, uh, just for marathon safety. But otherwise, this would be the last menu in the game. Uh, we're able to equip so many items now, and we're just needing healing a lot less that we're a lot now that we're a lot stronger, um, that we're able to just equip enough items for the rest of the game at this point. Don't let your guard down. Stay alert. So we're going to start this fight off by letting Wicked Shrub do what it's going to do. We're going to set up two Lion's Manes on Viola here on herself. Um, and then on Viola's first turn, we're going to kind of bring back that echo buffering mechanic where we're going to hit Wicked Shrub three times with her and then use Hawkeye, which is going to not consume any of our hits, but we're going to get to four echoes off of the Hawkeye hit. And then if we get lucky here, not quite. Sometimes the game will buffer and let you get to 24 echoes there, which makes this fight really, really clean. But it's really, really tight and definitely does not always happen. So we're just going to stall for a little bit here. Make sure we're topped off. We're going to get to 24 on March's turn here and then execute another 32 Echo Chain on Falsetto's turn. And unfortunately with this lineup, we have to hope it doesn't block, which it didn't, thankfully. So we're lined up here so that the Night Fist hits. Sometimes the bosses can get close enough together like that where the last hit of Howling Thunder will also hit too, which is really, really nice and just ensures we get some of these damage ranges. And thankfully we don't need to set up Hawkeye anymore in this fight. Uh, so we're just gonna be building echoes and uh, repeating for the rest of this fight pretty much. and then hoping we get the damage ranges. This is a weird angle that should still hit though. And we've done plenty of collateral damage to Ogre King, so we should be pretty good to 
take him out pretty cleanly. This is a fight where we used to Hawkeye a lot more, um, but my last pass over the route for this event has actually reduced a lot of these kind of setup moves like Shadow Silhouette Hawkeye from a lot of these fights. Um, as I mentioned way, way earlier in the run, um, kind of the way that Echoes scale is you end up getting about a 30% damage increase for every um, increment of four that you spend. Um, with Hawkeye and Shadow Silhouette kind of adding another like roughly 50-60% on top of that. So if you end up like wasting 12 Echoes on using Hawkeye because a special attack will consume them, um, it ends up kind of undoing the benefit you get from using it. Um, so a lot of those ended up just getting trimmed from the route, um, which has definitely made like turn order a lot less weird as well. Because you don't get weird situations where you're kind of like skipping around turns, waiting for violas. We actually got really low damage there. That's unfortunate. Even with all that extra damage. We should be able to finish off here, either with a few of these punches or with a Howling Thunder here. All right, cool. Nice. So something interesting to note with this fight and fights coming up too is this game does have a damage cap of 99,999. And we're already at the point, even at like our mid thirties level wise, that we're hitting that threshold um, on kind of the beefier hits of these combos. Um, so from this point on, if you're, you know, doing the post game dungeon and like trying to scale your power even more, you basically get more power from eventually like with scaling on the like uh hits like howling thunder that have a lot of smaller hits because they're just nowhere near hitting the damage cap so you're getting a lot of extra damage from um just a lot more individual hits versus bigger stronger ones so now that we've cleared xylophone tower we've opened up the barrier to the final dungeon um, and the final dungeon is going to be kind of a lengthy maze of two different towers. We need to kill two bosses on each side in order to funnel sand down to the bottom, which will allow us to get to the elevator at the bottom that will take us all the way to the final bosses at the top. Also, shout outs to our cat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Never apologize for cat. Maybe she'll scare off the goats. Oh, it's not working. She's turning around. super thirsty for attention. <clears throat> Well, she will have your undivided attention very soon. I miss her so much. She's been on my lap twice this run so far. Oh. And like half on your desk. <laughs> She's so sweet. And distracting. That's okay. Cats deserve it. So we're picking up one more chest here. This is uh, a weapon for March called Wheel of Will which is going to give her the darkness body effect. And it doesn't matter a ton, but it does give us some slightly easier setup with Viola. A lot of these boss rooms in this dungeon have, uh, the only darkness in the room is on the outer edges of the left and right. So if we want to set up Hawkeye, which we will still a decent amount, um, we'd have to run all the way to the edge of the arena and line ourselves in such a way that the boss wouldn't block uh, Viola by facing her. So it's a lot of extra movement to have to do that, and we want to avoid that if at all possible. Um, we are also going to menu on a new uh, weapon for... Uh, oops, wrong menu. Um, a new weapon for Falsetto called Tears Left Arm. And this is one of two items in the game that has a passive effect that makes it so that on hit, you add time back to your turn timer. Um, and as you might imagine, that's extremely broken, especially when they're added together. So we don't actually get the second one in the run because it's super out of the way. Um, but there's also an accessory called Broken Stopwatch that does the same thing. Um, and even just with Tears Left Arm, we're able to get a lot more hits on each of Falsetto's turns. Um, there's a lot of clips on YouTube and whatever of falsetto getting to crazy combo numbers with the combination of them and it's definitely one of the strongest things in this game is combining the two but even just the one is more than plenty to make falsetto ridiculously strong all 
Um, so kind of as I'm going between bosses here, there isn't a whole lot to talk about. So Cassie, if you've got more Chopin facts or if we've got more do donations, either of you, feel free to fire away. Sure, we've got a couple of donations here. Got a $30 donation from March's hat. I have fond memories <laughs> of playing Eternal Sonata with my sisters uh, with my sister years ago, and this is such a comfy overnight run. Two of my favorite things about it are the level up jingle and the SFX, whenever March uses Aurora Curtain. So shout outs to Chocolate Pudding at 4 a.m. Donation <laughs> will go to Runner's Choice. Then we have $25 from Mathia Griffin saying, "I'm really happy to see Eternal Sonata, e sorry, Eternal Sonata being featured in RPG Limit Break." I got this game 15 years ago when I got my PS3 console. I was going through a rough time and playing this game was exactly what I needed. Eternal Sonata is such an inspirational game and its battle mechanics are incredibly fun. Thanks, Aro, for running this game today. I'm glad there are more people out there who love this game as much as I do. Heck yeah. Yeah, this game actually has a lot of messaging throughout it, especially in the credits of just staying true to yourself and like owning your feelings and persevering through the darkest parts of your life like there's an entire section of the credits where each character kind of comes to the forefront and like looks at the screen and tells you like to not give up and you know all this positive messaging that's just really really fitting for a marathon like this so we got the first of our refights here um this is the reskin of killer knight from much earlier in the game um, almost all of these bosses is going to come down to just two uh, reverse chains with uh, 32 echoes with Hawkeye applied. So we're going to be mostly doing the same thing in each of these fights. And here using the shade provided by March's weapon um, to not have to move Viola nearly as much. And hopefully getting to 16 here. Good. And you're going to see the timer jumping around a lot on Falsetto's turns. This is going to make her a lot more self-sufficient and have a lot easier time building 16 Echoes on her turn, which is the main thing we need her to do at this point. Um, some of the movement to make these turn orders really clean is really, really tight with March in particular. Um, so this game starts your turn timer the instant you're able to control your character, not necessarily when the camera is in a like, spot that's centered on that character. Um, and there's a lot of instances where, based on the turn order and kind of what's going on in the fight, um, we're going to have to move March essentially blind to attempt to get um, the correct amount of hits. So we're going to have to skip around turns here, unfortunately. This boss also has kind of a weird hitbox where if you're trying to maximize the number of hits in a turn and get to the boss quickly, you kind of... It, it's really tight to get into a spot where you're actually going to hit the boss correctly. But even if you have to skip around turns and kind of get things back into alignment, it's not too bad to skip through turns and fix it. Are you catching on yet? And I was in a weird hitbox where he didn't die, actually. So we're going to have to do a little bit of finishing him off here. Yeah, unfortunately, as you saw there, you can kind of drop hits in your specials. Um if you just don't connect the hit. Like, it doesn't guarantee you hit the whole thing, which definitely comes into play on a lot of these fights if you're not standing in the right spot. That's better. That's better. So this dungeon, you can do these four refights in any order you want, um, as long as you know where they are. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she's so cute. Um, it largely doesn't matter for the sake of the speed run. Um, it is slightly faster to do the left side first because you start on the left side uh, when you enter the dungeon. Um, but you do get a lot of level ups from these fights. It doesn't really change the way you approach the fights too much, but it does let you um, squeeze a little bit of setup out of the fourth boss we're going to do, which is the Death Crow reskin. Um, but largely these fights are going to be Hawkeye uh, and then build the 32 Echoes and do a reverse chain with Falsetto. What are you doing there, bud? Okay. A lot of times these enemies will just kind of stare at you, but that one was being a little more aggressive than usual. Um, another instance of uh, the game kind of giving you control before you can fully see what's happening is on screen transitions. And this is one of the biggest areas where that kind of comes into play. So you can 
immediately input as soon as the next screen loads and the game's kind of like fading the screen in. Generally, a lot of these paths are pretty intuitive as far as, you know, you're continuing to hold a direction that's mostly the direction you were already holding. However, on the right side, on the way to the last boss, there's two that kind of throw a wrench in things, where you have to completely flip the stick the other direction. And it's definitely a test of whether I'm paying attention this late into a run. Uh, this part of the run is largely <laughs> just a victory lap. So there's a lot of times where, you know, I'll be on even good pace and I'll kind of check out in the middle of like one of these runs between bosses. And that fourth one, where the game kind of screws with you always gets me like there's always one of those screen transitions i end up missing so we'll uh we'll test myself and we'll see if i end up hitting them here but these floors are also mention... kind of oh go ahead go ahead okay <laughs> i was gonna mention too um so we talked a little bit about the extra dungeon at the end of the game called mysterious unison which is quite long it's got a lot of boss reskins and at the end you can um get back claves as a character um but in the ps3 version there's another extra dungeon with a super super boss called church of ezzy which throughout the game you have to get like i guess like certain key items to basically unlock it but um it's a really cool dungeon and the fight at the end is like super long because he has an insane amount of health um it's just like as he god i don't really know exactly can't remember what it is supposed to be but it's just like yeah church it's like a weird worshipers deity of, Ezzy. of this world that's kind of just like a giant like, yeah. weird maui statue like easter island head thing um it has the same like fetch quest to get all the items in this version um, but all it does is give you an Xbox achievement that, so like, Ezzy in numbers would be 321, and there's an achievement in this game that's worth 321 gamer score for completing that side quest. And it's definitely the most bizarre amount of points for an achievement I've ever seen in a game, for sure. Uh, and unfortunately, this boss has the same annoying tendency that the original Forest 4 does, where he kind of just charges around and does whatever. And this is another instance of this has never happened before because I've never seen him run after Viola like this. <laughs> so we're going to come to him and try to just fix this cleanly and hope that he doesn't run away again. I said hope that he doesn't run away again. <laughs> Please be a friend. This is a really nice spot to set up our next chain, though. Don't even have to move March at all. Okay, well, that cleaned itself up pretty nice. Can't complain about that too much. Another boss that did not die when it should have. Okay. That was perfect. Much better. All right, so that's the left side of the tower done. Now we're gonna get a little cutscene here of the sand flowing down to the bottom. I just gotta run over to the right side and do the same thing with uh, two more refights. See, so yeah, we've got a little bit more time for donations if you've got any more for us. I'm I'm just still just in awe you're whipping out like four hundred thousand damage in one turn. <laughs> um, we have reached the twenty six thousand uh, dollar mark with everyone's generous donations, and want you guys to know that all the uh, proceeds go directly to Nami, which I'd like to talk about for a second. Um, Nami is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization, whose work is focused around three pillars: education and support, awareness, advocacy. And what does that mean? Let's talk about awareness. Uh, NAMI drives the national conversation around mental health from coast to coast and across all demographics, having appeared in major media more than any other mental health organization in 2021. They have 24,000 earned media articles and top tier outlets, including NPR, CBS News, CNN, and the BBC. 
And Aro mentioned about reaching out for help uh, earlier in the run, and NAMI does have a helpline. Uh, the NAMI helpline is a free US-based nationwide peer support service providing information, uh, resource referrals, and support to people living with a mental health condition, um, their families, members, and caregivers, mental health providers, and the public. The NAMI helpline is available Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Time via call, text, and live web chat. In order to reach the helpline, you can call 1-800-950-6264, or you can even visit their website at nami.org help to access all of the NAMI helpline resources and their contact information. Uh, please note that the NAMI helpline is a free U.S.-based nationwide peer support service providing information. And yeah, check out their website. They have the resources and contact information. And uh, they are... Cassia, have any more uh, Chopin facts for us before we close out here? Hmm, I've had all the really good ones. At least to my knowledge. <laughs> yeah, this run has overall been relatively smooth. A couple of the fights haven't gone great, but I haven't had to reload any of my backup saves, which is definitely my goal for this run. So definitely more than happy with that. And thankfully, the reroutes have been a godsend this past couple weeks because I've had some really, really scuffed runs that were still sub 310. So hopefully we'll still uh, meet under that bar. I guess I could take this opportunity to really quickly shout out um, all the other people that have run this game over the years. There's not many of us, but um, some really cool people. Um, I shouted out Wasude Mono and SC2 Valor a great many times throughout this run, um, but shout outs to both of them. Shout outs to Mocha, shout outs to PX, Frockinock, Kia, Azure Symphony. I feel like I'm forgetting something, I'm sorry, or someone if I'm sorry if I forgot you, but um, yeah, it's a very small community of us that have run this game, but all of us love the game. We've all, you know, put a decent amount of time into it. And oh, Casa, oh my God, sorry, Casa, I love you. Yeah, shout outs to everyone. You're all great individuals. And you've definitely all kind of put your mark on this game and gotten it to where it is today. All right, so now we've got our baby dragon reskin called White Jewel. This is again third verse, going to be same as the first two. What's going on here? Um, this boss is a little bit more cooperative. So something I neglected to mention with kind of how the boss is blocking you works. Um, Enemies earlier in the game kind of have less aggressive tendencies as far as blocking you. A lot of times they'll just let you hit them in the face and not punish you for it. Um, and these reskinned bosses don't really seem to have updated AI to kind of keep up with where you are in the game. So a lot of these bosses, you can kind of just hit them from the front and they won't block. Um, generally, I don't risk it because this last party level we got actually increased our movement speed in combat. So it's largely not necessary to try to um, really eke out that much extra time from your turns, but there are definitely some situations where it's nice to um, do so. Thank <laughs> you. 
Third one down. One more to go. And yeah, you can see just how many levels we've gained just from this dungeon alone. We've gone from like mid 30s to mid 40s with just a couple fights. The experience scaling in this game is rather absurd as far as how quickly you can gain levels from just fighting bosses. It definitely works out for the better for us for the speedrun for sure. I'm trying to remember too, I think. So we, we went into this space-time rift to chase after this dragon monster, which we find out is at the end of this tower. Um, that ends up actually not being the final, final boss. Yeah, so after that so fight, um, Frederick kind of gets a grasp of what's actually going on. And um, after that fight, we're going to open up on... Um, a destroyed version of the flower field by Polka's um, house. And he's kind of going to come to and be like, okay, I understand the gravity of the situation. I understand I'm in this dream. Um, you know, everything's kind of falling apart around me. And he turns on us and um, kind of tries to defeat us as far as uh, just trying to stop us from, you know, shattering his dream world, basically. Um... And the end of the ending of the game basically involves um, Holka breaking the cycle um, with her own sacrifice, um, and then she's brought back through the magic of her Astra and all this crazy stuff. Uh, the game, again, the 360 version doesn't explain a lot of this stuff too much. The PS3 version recontextualizes a lot and goes a lot more in depth uh, and makes things make a lot more sense. The ending of this game is very, very wacky. Um, but yeah, that's basically the, the essence of um, kind of Frederick turning on us. Um, the final song for the final boss is also really, really cool. Um, so Sakuraba actually took uh, a piece by Chopin entitled Revolution and mixed it into a different composition called Scrap and Build Ourselves with Revolution. And it uses bits and pieces of Revolution in the piece. Um, when we get to that boss, it's a pretty simple fight, so I'm probably just going to stop talking and just let you guys enjoy it. Um, it is actually really cool. So Cassie and I just recently got back from a trip to um, England and uh, Paris. And when we were on the uh, at the train station to take the channel to um, Paris from England, um, there's just a piano in the station and someone just sat down and started playing Revolution. And it was just it was super, super cool and just super, super fitting just based on how we met and connected. And it was it was just a really cool thing to have happen. Yeah, every time we hear like Chopin music around us, we kind of give each other a look, we get really excited. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of perk up and we're like, it's happening. If it wasn't obvious, we are super piano and Chopin nerds. Yeah, we're definitely intending at some point to take a vacation to Poland and, um, you know, see all the Chopin Museum and all that stuff related there. Are you catching on yet? It's definitely on the old bucket list. So this fight's definitely the clunkiest of the refights. Um, it kind of has the same ads that the original fight did. He can revive them just like the original fight did. And um, this boss also just has the same weird hitbox that it had before. And it moving around can get rather annoying as well. So we're going to try to hope that it uh, doesn't move around too much here. Thankfully, this boss has the lowest amount of HP of all the bosses, and we've built up a bunch of level ups from doing the rest of these fights. So we are actually able to skip a Hawkeye on this fight, which makes the fight a lot cleaner. Um, so hopefully we should be able to finish it off here with one more reverse chain. Are you catching Not quite. We'll finish it off with a few more hits with Falsetto.
And strangely, these are some of the only bosses in the game that don't that do the weird magic poof that all the rest of the bosses do when they die. They kind of just flop over. I really never understood the significance of that, especially since, like, the animation's there and they don't use it for, like, the earlier version of the fight. It's just a very peculiar thing. All right, so that's the last of the four refights done. Uh, where we've got the sand filled up on the other side as well, and now we're going to make our trip back down to the basement so that we can fight the last two bosses. Uh, and the penultimate fight actually has my favorite song in the game called Broken Balance. It's just really good for an almost final boss theme. It has a lot of energy. Really, It's just really, really cool. I love it so much. Um, that fight is another fight that differs quite a lot in the PS3 version. So... We defeated Waltz. We won't see him anymore on this version. On the PS3 version, he's just in the fight that we're about to do. Um, and it makes the fight a lot messier and a lot harder. Um, so that's definitely a big sticking point for how the um, PS3 fight and, or PS3 run ends up handling fights. And it was definitely one of the hardest fights. Um, I know Valor was saying when uh, they were routing the PS3 version. It was just how to handle that fight. It was one of the biggest issues. This boss is also the only fight in the run that has an attack that can debuff your attack to kind of counteract your um, the various buffs that we have. Um, and the damage that we do to this boss is extremely tight as far as um, killing it in the number of turn cycles that we want to. So if we get attack debuffed, it can definitely take a little bit longer. And the boss can continue to debuff your attack continually, which gets really, really annoying, especially when you're on really good pace. And you get debuffed a million times, and you have to do like you know a good one or two extra turn cycles, and you just lose your run. This is also one of the bigger bosses where the um, echo glitch ends up coming into play a lot because the boss has a really weird large hitbox that kind of shifts around a lot and it can cause the echo glitch to happen um, more than anywhere else which is also an another annoying thing to lose really good pace runs to So we're going to ride the elevator all the way up. We're going to get one really cool long hallway before we get to the final boss room. This game, again, shout outs to this game's art direction. Some of these screens just look jaw dropping, especially for being a 2007 early 360 game. They just went all out with this game's visuals and it definitely shows. Yeah, these fights are largely the same as the refights, and uh, I've explained a little bit of the intricacies to this boss in particular, so I'm basically just going to let the music play and let you guys enjoy it, and uh, we're going to ride out these last couple bosses. Also, this is the thing that Logato turned into, by the way. I forgot to mention that. 
This is the weird thing that ripped open a hole in space and time. We're gonna hit him a couple extra times here just to make sure we kind of give ourselves a little buffer for that attack debuff that he gave us. There's a good chance this isn't enough. Yeah, have to finish him off a little bit here. Each debuff is actually a lot of damage loss, so it's really unfortunate when he does it. Yeah, this should do it. Oh, man. It's all right. One more should do it. All right, so we've got one more fight, and uh, time is going to end at the final. Uh, so after we fight the boss, we're going to get a save prompt, and time ends when it says save complete. Um, so I'll go ahead and call it out, but we've got another, like, two, three minutes, probably. Now, this is where we get the item that opens up the post-game dungeon. So you basically don't get access to it until right before the final boss. And if you want to go do the dungeon, you have to come all the way back out of this dungeon, and then it's on one of the screens in the desert before we entered here. So it's definitely really easy to miss on a first playthrough if you don't know to go back and look for it. It's really hard for me to not sing to this music. This song is so good. I love this song so much. Like, getting to the end of the run and this song playing is just like, feels good every single time. They're making use of the Shadow Tail here to make sure that Viola is always in shadow for her Hawkeye. Um, otherwise, we're kind of at the mercy of these clouds that move around the arena. They're the only source of darkness other than March. And we just want to make sure that we don't have to move around a ton to get access to Hawkeye. Frederick also has one really bad attack to get called Applaudismont Sonique, um, where he does like a really big long animation that takes several seconds to complete. Um, and he can do it right at the end of his turn and essentially get like two turns worth of time that you really don't want to see because it's really the big way to lose time on this fight. And there it is. Right when I got really locked cool, out of blocking too. It is really cool, yeah. We got two of them. That's not the worst I've ever seen. All right, we've got this last reverse chain, and then that will be it. Are you catching on yet? I don't know why I'm continually short on damage here. It's a little annoying, but... More marathon that's never happened before, so... There we go. So yeah, it'll be on save complete here. Nice. We're going to mash through some uh, save prompts here, and then that'll be it. And time.
So yeah, thanks everybody for watching. Thank you, Cassie, for calling in and doing this remote. Thank you, Tech, for allowing me to do this. Um, it means a lot to me that she wasn't able to be here and was able to still do the commentary for this run. That means so much to both of us. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody who hung out with us in the graveyard shift. And uh, yeah, without uh, holding anything up any longer, Cassie, you have anything, any final words? No, thank you so much. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, Oro, for that incredible run, and Cassie for the commentary and the Chopin facts. Uh, please note that Oro is also the artist that worked on the overlays for the stream, so definitely uh, give him a follow on his Twitter, at Orolen, that's O-U-R-O-L-E-N. Would love to echo some of the donation comments, so it was definitely a trip down a nostalgia, nostalgia lane, and still listen to the soundtrack sometimes on my way to work. So that was an awesome show. But I'm by Oro. Want you guys to know that you're still eligible for the Chrono Cross prizes until the end of uh, the Saga Scarlet Grace. And a quick uh, reminder of uh, what these prizes are they include the Chrono Cross uh, soundtrack revival disc, Chrono Cross the uh, Switch Edition the for Radical Dreamers, and then you have the Chrono Cross Vinyl, and then the very cool-looking Surge and Kid Pearlers. And with that being said, we're going to go ahead and run some ads, so we're going to take an ad break here.
right, guys. I will be signing off here and we'll be handing the torch to Zathian. Um, it was a pleasure hosting uh, these past two runs. At the meantime, we are also going to restart the stream. So hang on tight. We'll be right back. Good morrow, L RPG Limit Break. My name is Zathian, and I will be your host for the next run. Uh, can we get one more round of applause for Creative Ellie and his hosting pat just there and passing it off to me? Thank you very much. It is still but a clock in the morning over here in Salt Lake City, so thank you so much for everybody who's stopping by in the Twitch stream. Let's get some hype in there. Let's, uh, let's see who's still awake and ready for this run.
All right, we're just finishing up setup for Zone of the Enders, the Fist of Mars, any percent good on ending run. Uh, in the meantime, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of our sponsors. RPG Limit Break is once again proud to pr partner with the Yeti to bring you six awesome t-shirts that are now available, plus pins. Head over to theyeti.com slash RPGLB to take a look at the designs. Pick the ones you want and know that $5 from every teacher purchased will be donated to me. Remember, Yeti is spelled Y-E-T-E-E, theyeti.com slash RPGLB.